Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. This book is divided in three videos. This is part one. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter one. I go to Styles. The intense interest aroused in the public by what was known at the time as the Styles case has now somewhat subsided. Nevertheless, in view of the worldwide notoriety which attended it, I have been asked, both by my friend Poirot and the family themselves, to write an account of the whole story. This, we trust, will effectually silence the sensational rumours which still persist. I will therefore briefly set down the circumstances which led to my being connected with the affair. I had been invalided home from the front, and, after spending some months in a rather depressing convalescent home, was given a month's sick leave. Having no near relations or friends, I was trying to make up my mind what to do when I ran across John Cavendish. I had seen very little of him for some years. Indeed, I had never known him particularly well. He was a good fifteen years my senior, for one thing, though he hardly looked his forty-five years. As a boy, though, I had often stayed at Stiles, his mother's place in Essex. We had a good yarn about old times, and it ended in his inviting me down to Stiles to spend my leave there. The martyr will be delighted to see you again. After all those years, he added. Your mother keeps well, I asked. Oh, yes, I suppose you know that she has married again. I am afraid I showed my surprise rather plainly. Mrs. Cavendish, who had married John's father when he was a widower with two sons, had been a handsome woman of middle age as I remembered her. She certainly could not be a day less than seventy now. I recalled her as an energetic, autocratic personality, somewhat inclined to charitable and social notoriety, with a fondness for opening bazaars and playing the Lady Bountiful. She was a most generous woman and possessed a considerable fortune of her own. Their country place, Stiles Court, had been purchased by Mr Cavendish early in their married life. He had been completely under his wife's ascendancy, so much so that, on dying, he left the place to her for her lifetime as well as the larger part of his income, an arrangement that was distinctly on fire to his two sons. Their stepmother, however, had always been most generous to them. Indeed, they were so young at the time of their father's remarriage that they always thought of her as their own mother. Lawrence, the younger, had been a delicate youth. He had qualified as a doctor, but early relinquished the profession of medicine and lived at home while pursuing literary ambitions, though his verses never had any marked success. John practised for some time as a barrister, but had finally settled down to the more congenial life of a country squire. He had married two years ago and had taken his wife to live at Stiles, though I entertained a shrewd suspicion that he would have preferred his mother to increase his allowance, which would have enabled him to have a home of his own. Mrs Cavendish, however, was a lady who liked to make her own plans, and expected other people to fall in with them. And in this case, she certainly had the whip hand, namely, the purse strings. John noticed my surprise at the news of his mother's remarriage and smiled rather ruefully. Rotten little bounder too, he said savagely. I can tell you, Hastings, it's making life jolly difficult for us. As for Evie, you remember Evie? No. Oh. I suppose she was after your time. She's the mater's factotum companion, jack of all trades. A great sport, old Evie. Not precisely young and beautiful, but as game as they make them. You were going to say, e Oh, this fellow. He turned up from nowhere, on the pretext of being a second cousin, or something of Evie's, though she didn't seem particularly keen to acknowledge the relationship. The fellow is an absolute outsider. Anyone can see that. He's got a great black beard 
and wears patent leather boots in all weathers. But the martyr cottoned to him at once, took him on as secretary. You know how she's always running a hundred societies? I nodded. Well, of course, the war has turned the hundreds into thousands. No doubt the fellow was very useful to her. But you could have knocked us all down with a feather when, three months ago, she suddenly announced that she and Alfred were engaged. The fellow must be at least twenty years younger than she is. It's simply barefaced fortune hunting. But there you are. She is her own mistress, and she's married him. It must be a difficult situation for you all. Difficult. It's damnable. Thus it came about that, three days later, I descended from the train at Stiles St. Mary, an absurd little station, with no apparent reason for existence, perched up in the midst of green fields and country lanes. John Cavendish was waiting on the platform and piloted me out to the car. Got a drop or two of petrol still, you see, he remarked, mainly owing to the mater's activities. The village of Stiles St. Mary was situated about two miles from the little station, and Stiles Court lay a mile the other side of it. It was a still, warm day in early July. As one looked out over the flat Essex country, lying so green and peaceful under the afternoon sun, it seemed almost impossible to believe that, not so very far away, a great war was running its appointed course. I felt I had suddenly strayed into another world. As we turned in at the lodge gates, John said, I'm afraid you'll find it very quiet down here, Hastings. My dear fellow, that's just what I want. Oh, it's pleasant enough if you want to lead the idle life. I drill with the volunteers twice a week and lend a hand at the farms. My wife works regularly on the land. She is up at five every morning to milk and keeps at it steadily until lunchtime. It's a jolly good life taking it all round, if it weren't for that fellow Alfred Inglethorpe. He checked the car suddenly and glanced at his watch. I wonder if we've time to pick up Cynthia. No, she'll have started from the hospital by now. Cynthia, that's not your wife. No, Cynthia is a protege of my mother's, the daughter of an old schoolfellow of hers who married a rascally solicitor. He came a cropper and the girl was left an orphan and penniless. My mother came to the rescue and Cynthia has been with us nearly two years now. She works in the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster, seven miles away. As he spoke the last words, we drew up in front of the fine old house. A lady in a stout tweed skirt, who was bending over a flower bed, straightened herself at our approach. Hello, Evie. Here's our wounded hero, Mr. Hastings, Miss Howard. Miss Howard shook hands with a hearty, almost painful grip. I had an impression of very blue eyes in a sunburnt face. She was a pleasant-looking woman of about 40, with a deep voice, almost manly in its stentorian tones, and had a large, sensible, square body with feet to match, these last encased in good, thick boots. Her conversation, I soon found, was couched in the telegraphic style. Weeds grow like house of fire. Can't keep even with them. Shall press you in. Better be careful. I'm sure I shall be only too delighted to make myself useful, I responded. Don't say it. Never does. Wish you hadn't later. You're a cynic, Evie, said John, laughing. Where's tea today, inside or out? Out. Too fine a day to be cooped up in the house. Come on, then. You've done enough gardening for today. The labourer is worthy of his hire, you know. Come and be refreshed. Well, said Miss Howard drawing off her gardening gloves. I'm inclined to agree with you. She led the way round the house to where tea was spread under the shade of a large sycamore. A figure rose from one of the basket chairs and came a few steps to meet us. My wife Hastings, said John. I shall never forget my first sight of Mary Cavendish. Her tall, slender form, outlined against the bright light,
the vivid sense of slumbering fire that seemed to find expression only in those wonderful tawny eyes of hers. Remarkable eyes, different from any other woman's that I have ever known. The intense power of stillness she possessed, which nevertheless conveyed the impression of a wild, untamed spirit in an exquisitely civilized body. All these things are burnt into my memory. I shall never forget them. She greeted me with a few words of pleasant welcome in a low, clear voice, and I sank into a basket chair, feeling distinctly glad that I had accepted John's invitation. Mrs. Cavendish gave me some tea, and her few quiet remarks heightened my first impression of her as a thoroughly fascinating woman. An appreciative listener is always stimulating, and I described in a humorous manner certain incidents of my convalescent home, in a way which I flatter myself greatly amused my hostess. John, of course, good fellow though he is, could hardly be called a brilliant conversationalist. At that moment, a well-remembered voice floated through the open French window near at hand. Then you'll write to the princess after tea, Alfred? I'll write to Lady Tadminster for the second day myself. Or shall we wait until we hear from the princess? In case of a refusal, Lady Tadminster might open it the first day and Mrs. Crosby the second. Then there's the Duchess about the school fit. There was the murmur of a man's voice, and then Mrs. Inglethorpe's rose in reply. Yes, certainly. After tea will do quite well. You are so thoughtful, Alfred, dear. The French window swung open a little wider, and a handsome, white-haired old lady, with a somewhat masterful cast of features, stepped out of it onto the lawn. A man followed her, a suggestion of deference in his manner. Mrs. Inglethorpe greeted me with effusion. Why, if it isn't too delightful to see you again, Mr. Hastings, after all these years. Alfred, darling, Mr. Hastings, my husband. I looked with some curiosity at Alfred, darling. He certainly struck a rather alien note. I did not wonder at John objecting to his beard. It was one of the longest and blackest I have ever seen. He wore gold-rimmed pince-nez and had a curious impassivity of feature. It struck me that he might look natural on a stage, but was strangely out of place in real life. His voice was rather deep and unctuous. He placed a wooden hand in mine and said, This is a pleasure, Mr. Hastings. Then, turning to his wife, Emily, dearest, I think that cushion is a little damp. She beamed fondly on him as he substituted another with every demonstration of the tenderest care. Strange infatuation of an otherwise sensible woman. With the presence of Mr. Inglethorpe, a sense of constraint and veiled hostility seemed to settle down upon the company. Miss Howard, in particular, took no pains to conceal her feelings. Mrs. Inglethorpe, however, seemed to notice nothing unusual. Her volubility, which I remembered of old, had lost nothing in the intervening years, and she poured out a steady flood of conversation, mainly on the subject of the forthcoming bazaar which she was organising and which was to take place shortly. Occasionally she referred to her husband over a question of days or dates. His watchful and attentive manner never varied. From the very first, I took a firm and rooted dislike to him, and I flatter myself that my first judgments are usually fairly shrewd. Presently, Mrs. Inglethorpe turned to give some instructions about letters to Evelyn Howard, and her husband addressed me in his painstaking voice. Is soldiering your regular profession, Mr. Hastings? No, before the war I was in Lloyd's. And you will return there after it is over? Perhaps. Either that or a fresh start altogether. Mary Cavendish leant forward. What would you really choose as a profession if you could just consult your inclination? Well, that depends. No secret hobby? she asked. Tell me. You're drawn to something. Everyone is. <laughs>
usually something absurd. You'll laugh at me. She smiled. Perhaps. Well, I've always had a secret hankering to be a detective. The real thing, Scotland Yard or Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Sherlock Holmes, by all means. But really, seriously, I am awfully drawn to it. I came across a man in Belgium once, a very famous detective, and he quite inflamed me. He was a marvellous little fellow. He used to say that all good detective work was a mere matter of method. My system is based on his, though, of course, I have progressed rather further. He was a funny little man, a great dandy, but wonderfully clever. Like a good detective story myself, remarked Miss Howard. Lots of nonsense written, though. Criminal discovered in last chapter. Everyone dumbfounded. Real crime. You'd know at once. There have been a great number of undiscovered crimes, I argued. Don't mean the police, but the people that are right in it. The family. You couldn't really hoodwink them. They'd know. Then, I said, much amused, you think that if you were mixed up in a crime, say a murder, you'd be able to spot the murderer right off. Of course I should. Mightn't be able to prove it to a pack of lawyers, but I'm certain I'd know. I'd feel it in my fingertips if he came near me. It might be a she, I suggested. Might? But murder's a violent crime. Associate it more with a man. Not in a case of poisoning. Mrs. Cavendish's clear voice startled me. Dr. Bowerstein was saying yesterday that, owing to the general ignorance of the more uncommon poisons among the medical profession, there were probably countless cases of poisoning quite unsuspected. Why, Mary, what a gruesome conversation, cried Mrs. Inglethorpe. It makes me feel as if a goose were walking over my grave. Oh, there's Cynthia. A young girl in VAD uniform ran lightly across the lawn. Why, Cynthia, you are late today. This is Mr. Hastings, Miss Murdoch. Cynthia Murdoch was a fresh-looking young creature, full of life and vigour. She tossed off her little VAD cap, and I admired the great loose waves of her auburn hair and the smallness and whiteness of the hand she held out to claim her tea. With dark eyes and eyelashes, she would have been a beauty. She flung herself down on the ground beside John, and as I handed her a plate of sandwiches, she smiled up at me. Sit down here on the grass, do. It's ever so much nicer. I dropped down obediently. You work at Tadminster, don't you, Miss Murdoch? She nodded. For my sins. Do they bully you then? I asked, smiling. I should like to see them, cried Cynthia with dignity. I have got a cousin who is nursing, I remarked, and she is terrified of sisters. I don't wonder. Sisters are, you know, Mr. Hastings. They simply are. You've no idea. But I'm not a nurse, thank heaven. I work in the dispensary. How many people do you poison? I asked, smiling. Cynthia smiled too. Oh, hundreds, she said. Cynthia, called Mrs. Inglethorpe, do you think you could write a few notes for me? Certainly, Aunt Emily. She jumped up promptly, and something in her manner reminded me that her position was a dependent one, and that Mrs. Inglethorpe, kind as she might be in the main, did not allow her to forget it. My hostess turned to me. John will show you your room. Supper is at half past seven. We have given up late dinner for some time now. Lady Tadminster, our member's wife, she was the late Lord Abbotsbury's daughter, does the same. She agrees with me that one must set an example of economy. We are quite a war household. Nothing is wasted here. Every scrap of waste paper, even, is saved and sent away in sacks. I expressed my appreciation, and John took me into the house and up the broad staircase, which forked right and left halfway to different wings of the building. My room was in the left wing and looked out over the park. John left me 
and a few minutes later, I saw him from my window walking slowly across the grass, arm in arm with Cynthia Murdoch. I heard Mrs. Inglethorpe call Cynthia impatiently, and the girl started and ran back to the house. At the same moment, a man stepped out from the shadow of a tree and walked slowly in the same direction. He looked about 40, very dark, with a melancholy, clean-shaven face. Some violent emotion seemed to be mastering him. He looked up at my window as he passed, and I recognised him, though he had changed much in the fifteen years that had elapsed since we last met. It was John's younger brother, Lawrence Cavendish. I wondered what it was that had brought that singular expression to his face. Then I dismissed him from my mind and returned to the contemplation of my own affairs. The evening passed pleasantly enough, and I dreamed that night of that enigmatical woman, Mary Cavendish. The next morning dawned bright and sunny, and I was full of the anticipation of a delightful visit. I did not see Mrs. Cavendish until lunchtime when she volunteered to take me for a walk, and we spent a charming afternoon roaming in the woods, returning to the house about five. As we entered the large hall, John beckoned us both into the smoking room. I saw at once by his face that something disturbing had occurred. We followed him in, and he shut the door after us. Look here, Mary, there's the deuce of a mess. Evie's had a row with Alfred Inglethorpe and she's off. Evie? Off? John nodded gloomily. Yes, you see she went to the martyr and... Oh, here's Evie herself. Miss Howard entered. Her lips were set grimly together and she carried a small suitcase. She looked excited and determined and slightly on the defensive. At any rate, she burst out, I've spoken my mind. My dear Evelyn, cried Mrs. Cavendish, this can't be true. Miss Howard nodded grimly. True enough. Afraid I said some things to Emily she won't forget or forgive in a hurry. Don't mind if they've only sunk in a bit. Probably water off a duck's back, though. I said right out, you're an old woman, Emily, and there's no fool like an old fool. The man's twenty years younger than you, and don't you fool yourself as to what he married you for. Money, well, don't let him have too much of it. Farmer Rakes has got a very pretty young wife. Just ask your Alfred how much time he spends over there. She was very angry. Natural, I went on. I'm going to warn you, whether you like it or not. That man would as soon murder you in your bed as look at you. He's a bad lot. You can say what you like to me, but remember what I've told you. He's a bad lot. What did she say? Miss Howard made an extremely expressive grimace. Darling Alfred, dearest Alfred, wicked calumnies, wicked lies, wicked woman, to accuse her dear husband. The sooner I left her house, the better. So I'm off. But not now. This minute! For a moment, we sat and stared at her. Finally, John Cavendish, finding his persuasions of no avail, went off to look up the trains. His wife followed him, murmuring something about persuading Mrs. Inglethorpe to think better of it. As she left the room, Miss Howard's face changed. She leant towards me eagerly. Mr. Hastings, you're honest. I can trust you. I was a little startled. She laid her hand on my arm and sank her voice to a whisper. Look after her, Mr. Hastings, my poor Emily. There are a lot of sharks, all of them. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. There isn't one of them that's not hard up and trying to get money out of her. I have protected her as much as I could. Now I'm out of the way. They'll impose upon her. Of course, Miss Howard, I said. I'll do everything I can, but I'm sure you're excited and overwrought. She interrupted me by slowly shaking her forefinger. Young man, trust me. I've lived in the world rather longer than you have. All I ask you is to keep your eyes open. You'll see what I mean.
The throb of the motor came through the open window, and Miss Howard rose and moved to the door. John's voice sounded outside. With her hand on the handle, she turned her head over her shoulder and beckoned to me. Above all, Mr. Hastings, watch that devil, her husband. There was no time for more. Miss Howard was swallowed up in an eager chorus of protests and goodbyes. The Inglethorpes did not appear. As the motor drove away, Mrs. Cavendish suddenly detached herself from the group and moved across the drive to the lawn to meet a tall, bearded man who had been evidently making for the house. The colour rose in her cheeks as she held out her hand to him. Who is that? I asked sharply, for instinctively I distrusted the man. That's Dr. Bowerstein, said John shortly. And who is Dr. Bowerstein? He's staying in the village doing a rescue after a bad nervous breakdown. He's a London specialist, a very clever man, one of the greatest living experts on poisons, I believe. And he's a great friend of Mary's, put in Cynthia, the irrepressible. John Cavendish frowned and changed the subject. Come for a stroll, Hastings. This has been a most rotten business. She always had a rough tongue, but there is no stauncher friend in England than Evelyn Howard. He took the path through the plantation, and we walked down to the village through the woods, which bordered one side of the estate. As we passed through one of the gates on our way home again, a pretty young woman of gypsy type coming in the opposite direction bowed and smiled. That's a pretty girl, I remarked appreciatively. John's face harder Ned. That is Mrs. Rakes, the one that Miss Howard... Exactly, said John, with rather unnecessary abruptness. I thought of the white-haired old lady in the big house, and that vivid, wicked little face that had just smiled into ours, and a vague chill of foreboding crept over me. I brushed it aside. Styles is really a glorious old place, I said to John. He nodded rather gloomily. Yes, it's a fine property. It'll be mine some day. Should be mine now by rights, if my father had only made a decent will and then I shouldn't be so damned hard up as I am now. Hard up, are you? My dear Hastings, I don't mind telling you that I'm at my wit's end for money. Couldn't your brother help you? Lawrence, he's gone through every penny he ever had, publishing rotten verses in fancy bindings. No, we're an impecunious lot. My mother's always been awfully good to us, I must say. That is up to now, since her marriage, of course, he broke off, frowning. For the first time I felt that, with Evelyn Howard, something indefinable had gone from the atmosphere. Her presence had spelt security. Now that security was removed, and the air seemed rife with suspicion, the sinister face of Dr. Bowerstein recurred to me unpleasantly. A vague suspicion of everyone and everything filled my mind. Just for a moment I had a premonition of approaching evil. Chapter 2 The 16th and 17th of July I had arrived at Stiles on the 5th of July. I come now to the events of the 16th and 17th of that month. For the convenience of the reader, I will recapitulate the incidents of those days in as exact a manner as possible. They were elicited subsequently at the trial by a process of long and tedious cross-examinations. I received a letter from Evelyn Howard a couple of days after her departure, telling me she was working as a nurse at the big hospital in Midlingham, a manufacturing town some 15 miles away, and begging me to let her know if Mrs Inglethorpe should show any wish to be reconciled. The only fly in the ointment of my peaceful days was Mrs. Cavendish's extraordinary and, for my part, unaccountable preference for the society of Dr. Bowerstein. What she saw in the man I cannot imagine, but she was always asking him up to the house and often went off for long expeditions with him 
I must confess that I was quite unable to see his attraction. The 16th of July fell on a Monday. It was a day of turmoil. The famous bazaar had taken place on Saturday, and an entertainment, in connection with the same charity, at which Mrs Inglethorpe was to recite a war poem, was to be held that night. We were all busy during the morning, arranging and decorating the hall in the village where it was to take place. We had a late luncheon and spent the afternoon resting in the garden. I noticed that John's manner was somewhat unusual. He seemed very excited and restless. After tea, Mrs Inglethorpe went to lie down to rest before her efforts in the evening, and I challenged Mary Cavendish to a single at tennis. About a quarter to seven, Mrs Inglethorpe called us that we should be late as supper was early that night. We had rather a scramble to get ready in time, and before the meal was over, the motor was waiting at the door. The entertainment was a great success, Mrs Inglethorpe's recitation receiving tremendous applause. There were also some tableaux in which Cynthia took part. She did not return with us, having been asked to a supper party and to remain the night with some friends who had been acting with her in the tableau. The following morning, Mrs Inglethorpe stayed in bed to breakfast, as she was rather overtired, but she appeared in her briskest mood about 12.30 and swept Lawrence and myself off to a luncheon party. Such a charming invitation from Mrs Rolleston, Lady Tadminster's sister, you know. The Rollestons came over with the Conqueror, one of our oldest families. Mary had excused herself on the plea of an engagement with Dr Bowerstein. We had a pleasant luncheon, and as we drove away, Lawrence suggested that we should return by Tadminster, which was barely a mile out of our way, and pay a visit to Cynthia in her dispensary. Mrs Inglethorpe replied that this was an excellent idea, but as she had several letters to write, she would drop us there, and we could come back with Cynthia in the pony trap. We were detained under suspicion by the hospital porter until Cynthia appeared to vouch for us, looking very cool and sweet in her long white overall. She took us up to her sanctum and introduced us to her fellow dispenser, a rather awe-inspiring individual whom Cynthia cheerily addressed as Nibs. What a lot of bottles, I exclaimed, as my eye travelled round the small room. Do you really know what's in them all? Say something original, groaned Cynthia. Every single person who comes up here says that. We are really thinking of bestowing a prize on the first individual who does not say, what a lot of bottles. And I know the next thing you're going to say is, how many people have you poisoned? I pleaded guilty with a laugh. If you people only knew how fatally easy it is to poison someone by mistake, you wouldn't joke about it. Come on, let's have tea. We've got all sorts of secret stores in that cupboard. No, Lawrence, that's the poison cupboard. The big cupboard. That's right. We had a very cheery tea and assisted Cynthia to wash up afterwards. We had just put away the last teaspoon when a knock came at the door. The countenances of Cynthia and Nibs were suddenly petrified into a stern and forbidding expression. Come in, said Cynthia, in a sharp, professional tone. A young and rather scared-looking nurse appeared with a bottle which she proffered to Nibs, who waved her towards Cynthia with the somewhat enigmatical remark, I'm not really here today. Cynthia took the bottle and examined it with the severity of a judge. This should have been sent up this morning. Sister is very sorry, she forgot. Sister should read the rules outside the door. I gathered from the little nurse's expression that there was not the least likelihood of her having the hardihood to retail this message to the dreaded sister. So now it can't be done until tomorrow, finished Cynthia. Don't you think you could possibly let us have it tonight? Well, said Cynthia graciously, we are very busy, but if we have time, it shall be done. The little nurse withdrew 
and Cynthia promptly took a jar from the shelf, refilled the bottle, and placed it on the table outside the door. I laughed. Discipline must be maintained. Exactly. Come out on our little balcony. You can see all the outside wards there. I followed Cynthia and her friend, and they pointed out the different wards to me. Lawrence remained behind, but after a few moments, Cynthia called to him over her shoulder to come and join us. Then she looked at her watch. Nothing more to do, Nibs? No. All right, then we can lock up and go. I had seen Lawrence in quite a different light that afternoon. Compared to John, he was an astoundingly difficult person to get to know. He was the opposite of his brother in almost every respect, being unusually shy and reserved. Yet he had a certain charm of manner, and I fancied that, if one really knew him well, one could have a deep affection for him. I had always fancied that his manner to Cynthia was rather constrained, and that she, on her side, was inclined to be shy of him. But they were both gay enough this afternoon and chatted together like a couple of children. As we drove through the village, I remembered that I wanted some stamps, so accordingly, we pulled up at the post office. As I came out again, I cannoned into a little man who was just entering. I drew aside and apologised, when suddenly, with a loud exclamation, he clasped me in his arms and kissed me warmly. Mon ami Hastings, he cried. It is indeed. Mon ami Hastings. Poirot, I exclaimed. I turned to the pony trap. This is a very pleasant meeting for me, Miss Cynthia. This is my old friend, Monsieur Poirot, whom I have not seen for years. Oh, we know Monsieur Poirot, said Cynthia gaily but I had no idea he was a friend of yours. Yes, indeed, said Poirot seriously. I know Mademoiselle Cynthia. It is by the charity of that good Mrs. Inglethorpe that I am here. Then, as I looked at him inquiringly, yes, my friend, she had kindly extended hospitality to seven of my country people, who, alas, are refugees from their native land. We Belgians will always remember her with gratitude. Poirot was an extraordinary-looking little man. He was hardly more than five feet, four inches, but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little on one side. His moustache was very stiff and military. The neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Yet this quaint, dandified little man who, I was sorry to see, now limped badly, had been in his time one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. As a detective, his flair had been extraordinary, and he had achieved triumphs by unravelling some of the most baffling cases of the day. He pointed out to me the little house inhabited by him and his fellow Belgians, and I promised to go and see him at an early date. Then he raised his hat with a flourish to Cynthia, and we drove away. He's a dear little man, said Cynthia. I'd no idea you knew him. You've been entertaining a celebrity unawares, I replied. And for the rest of the way home, I recited to them the various exploits and triumphs of Hercule Poirot. We arrived back in a very cheerful mood. As we entered the hall, Mrs. Inglethorpe came out of her boudoir. She looked flushed and upset. Oh, it's you, she said. Is there anything the matter, Aunt Emily? asked Cynthia. Certainly not, said Mrs. Inglethorpe sharply. What should there be? Then, catching sight of Dorcas, the parlour maid, going into the dining room, she called to her to bring some stamps into the boudoir. Yes, ma'am. The old servant hesitated, then added diffidently, Don't you think, Mum, you'd better get to bed. You're looking very tired. Perhaps you're right, Dorcas. Yes, no, not now. I've some letters I must finish by post time. Have you lighted the fire in my room as I told you? Yes, Mum. <laughs>
Then I'll go to bed directly after supper. She went into the boudoir again, and Cynthia stared after her. Goodness gracious, I wonder what's up, she said to Lawrence. He did not seem to have heard her, for without a word, he turned on his heel and went out of the house. I suggested a quick game of tennis before supper, and Cynthia agreeing, I ran upstairs to fetch my racket. Mrs. Cavendish was coming down the stairs. It may have been my fancy, but she too was looking odd and disturbed. Had a good walk with Dr. Bauerstein? I asked, trying to appear as indifferent as I could. I didn't go, she replied abruptly. Where is Mrs. Inglethorpe? In the boudoir. Her hand clenched itself on the banisters, then she seemed to nerve herself for some encounter and went rapidly past me down the stairs across the hall to the boudoir, the door of which she shut behind her. As I ran out to the tennis court a few moments later, I had to pass the open boudoir window and was unable to help overhearing the following scrap of dialogue. Mary Cavendish was saying in the voice of a woman desperately controlling herself, Then you won't show it to me? To which Mrs. Inglethorpe replied, My dear Mary, it has nothing to do with that matter. Then show it to me. I tell you, it is not what you imagine. It does not concern you in the least. To which Mary Cavendish replied, with a rising bitterness, Of course, I might have known you would shield him. Cynthia was waiting for me and greeted me eagerly with, I say, there's been the most awful row. I've got it all out of Dorcas. What kind of a row? Between Aunt Emily and him. I do hope she's found him out at last. Was Dorcas there then? Of course not. She happened to be near the door. It was a real old bust up. I do wish I knew what it was all about. I thought of Mrs. Rakes's gypsy face and Evelyn Howard's warnings, but wisely decided to hold my peace, whilst Cynthia exhausted every possible hypothesis and cheerfully hoped, Aunt Emily will send him away and will never speak to him again. I was anxious to get hold of John, but he was nowhere to be seen. Evidently, Something very momentous had occurred that afternoon. I tried to forget the few words I had overheard, but do what I would, I could not dismiss them altogether from my mind. What was Mary Cavendish's concern in the matter? Mr. Inglethorpe was in the drawing room when I came down to supper. His face was impassive as ever, and the strange unreality of the man struck me afresh. Mrs. Inglethorpe came down last. She still looked agitated, and during the meal, there was a somewhat constrained silence. Inglethorpe was unusually quiet. As a rule, he surrounded his wife with little attentions, placing a cushion at her back, and altogether playing the part of the devoted husband. Immediately after supper, Mrs. Inglethorpe retired to her boudoir again. Send my coffee in here, Mary, she called. I've just five minutes to catch the post. Cynthia and I went and sat by the open window in the drawing room. Mary Cavendish brought our coffee to us. She seemed excited. Do you young people want lights? Or do you enjoy the twilight? She asked. Will you take Mrs. Inglethorpe her coffee, Cynthia? I will pour it out. Do not trouble, Mary, said Inglethorpe. I will take it to Emily. He poured it out and went out of the room carrying it carefully. Lawrence followed him and Mrs. Cavendish sat down by us. We three sat for some time in silence. It was a glorious night, hot and still. Mrs. Cavendish fanned herself gently with a palm leaf. It's almost too hot, she murmured. We shall have a thunderstorm. Alas! that these harmonious moments can never endure. My paradise was rudely shattered by the sound of a well-known and heartily disliked voice in the hall. Dr. Bowerstein, exclaimed Cynthia, what a funny time to come. 
I glanced jealously at Mary Cavendish, but she seemed quite undisturbed. The delicate pallor of her cheeks did not vary. In a few moments, Alfred Inglethorpe had ushered the doctor in, the latter laughing and protesting that he was in no fit state for a drawing room. In truth, he presented a sorry spectacle, being literally plastered with mud. What have you been doing, doctor? cried Mrs. Cavendish. I must make my apologies, said the doctor. I did not really mean to come in, but Mr. Inglethorpe insisted. Well, Bowerstein, you are in a plight, said John, strolling in from the hall. Have some coffee and tell us what you have been up to. Thank you, I will. He laughed rather ruefully as he described how he had discovered a very rare species of fern in an inaccessible place, and in his efforts to obtain it, had lost his footing and slipped ignominiously into a neighbouring pond. The sun soon dried me off, he added, but I'm afraid my appearance is very disreputable. At this juncture, Mrs Inglethorpe called to Cynthia from the hall, and the girl ran out. Just carry up my dispatch case, will you, dear? I'm going to bed. The door into the hall was a wide one. I had risen when Cynthia did. John was close by me. There were therefore three witnesses who could swear that Mrs Inglethorpe was carrying her coffee, as yet untasted, in her hand. My evening was utterly and entirely spoilt by the presence of Dr Bowerstein. It seemed to me the man would never go. He rose at last, however, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I'll walk down to the village with you, said Mr Inglethorpe. I must see our agent over those estate accounts. He turned to John. No one need sit up. I will take the latch key. Chapter 3. The Night of the Tragedy. To make this part of my story clear, I append the following plan of the first floor of Styles. The servants' rooms are reached through the door B. They have no communication with the right wing where the Inglethorpe's rooms were situated. It seemed to be the middle of the night when I was awakened by Lawrence Cavendish. He had a candle in his hand, and the agitation of his face told me at once that something was seriously wrong. What's the matter? I asked, sitting up in bed and trying to collect my scattered thoughts. We are afraid my mother is very ill. She seems to be having some kind of fit. Unfortunately, she has locked herself in. I'll come at once. I sprang out of bed and, pulling on a dressing gown, followed Lawrence along the passage and the gallery to the right wing of the house. John Cavendish joined us, and one or two of the servants were standing round in a state of awe-stricken excitement. Lawrence turned to his brother. What do you think we had better do? Never, I thought, had his indecision of character been more apparent. John rattled the handle of Mrs Inglethorpe's door violently, but with no effect. It was obviously locked or bolted on the inside. The whole household was aroused by now. The most alarming sounds were audible from the interior of the room. Clearly, something must be done. Try going through Mr Inglethorpe's room, sir, cried Dorcas. Oh, the poor mistress. Suddenly I realised that Alfred Inglethorpe was not with us, that he alone had given no sign of his presence. John opened the door of his room. It was pitch dark, but Lawrence was following with the candle, and by its feeble light we saw that the bed had not been slept in and that there was no sign of the room having been occupied. We went straight to the connecting door. That too was locked or bolted on the inside. What was to be done? Oh dear, sir, cried Dorcas, wringing her hands. Whatever shall we do? We must try and break the door in, I suppose. It'll be a tough job, though. Here, let one of the maids go down and wake Bailey and tell him to go for Dr. Wilkins at once. Now then, we'll have a try at the door. Half a moment, though. Isn't there a door into Miss Cynthia's rooms? Yes, sir, but that's always bolted. 
it's never been undone. Well, we might just see. He ran rapidly down the corridor to Cynthia's room. Mary Cavendish was there, shaking the girl, who must have been an unusually sound sleeper, and trying to wake her. In a moment or two, he was back. No good. That's bolted too. We must break in the door. I think this one is a shade less solid than the one in the passage. We strained and heaved together. The framework of the door was solid, and for a long time it resisted our efforts, but at last we felt it give beneath our weight, and finally, with a resounding crash, it was burst open. We stumbled in together, Lawrence still holding his candle. Mrs. Inglethorpe was lying on the bed, her whole form agitated, by violent convulsions, in one of which she must have overturned the table beside her. As we entered, however, her limbs relaxed, and she fell back upon the pillows. John strode across the room and lit the gas. Turning to Annie, one of the housemaids, he sent her downstairs to the dining room for brandy. Then he went across to his mother whilst I unbolted the door that gave on the corridor. I turned to Lawrence to suggest that I had better leave them now that there was no further need of my services. But the words were frozen on my lips. Never have I seen such a ghastly look on any man's face. He was white as chalk, the candle he held in his shaking hand was sputtering onto the carpet, and his eyes, petrified with terror or some such kindred emotion, stared fixedly over my head at a point on the further wall. It was as though he had seen something that turned him to stone. I instinctively followed the direction of his eyes, but I could see nothing unusual. The still feebly flickering ashes in the grate and the row of prim ornaments on the mantelpiece were surely harmless enough. The violence of Mrs. Inglethorpe's attack seemed to be passing. She was able to speak in short gasps. Better now, very sudden, stupid of me, to lock myself in. A shadow fell on the bed, and, looking up, I saw Mary Cavendish standing near the door with her arm around Cynthia. She seemed to be supporting the girl, who looked utterly dazed and unlike herself. Her face was heavily flushed, and she yawned repeatedly. Poor Cynthia is quite frightened, said Mrs Cavendish, in a low, clear voice. She herself, I noticed, was dressed in her white land smock. Then it must be later than I thought. I saw that a faint streak of daylight was showing through the curtains of the windows and that the clock on the mantelpiece pointed to close upon five o'clock. A strangled cry from the bed startled me. A fresh access of pain seized the unfortunate old lady. The convulsions were of a violence terrible to behold. Everything was confusion. We thronged round her, powerless to help or alleviate. A final convulsion lifted her from the bed until she appeared to rest upon her head and her heels, with her body arched in an extraordinary manner. In vain, Mary and John tried to administer more brandy. The moments flew. Again, the body arched itself in that peculiar fashion. At that moment, Dr. Bowerstein pushed his way authoritatively into the room. For one instant, he stopped dead staring at the figure on the bed, and, at the same instant, Mrs. Inglethorpe cried out in a strangled voice, her eyes fixed on the doctor. Alfred! Alfred! Then she fell back motionless on the pillows. With a stride, the doctor reached the bed, and seizing her arms worked them energetically, applying what I knew to be artificial respiration. He issued a few short, sharp orders to the servants. An imperious wave of his hand drove us all to the door. We watched him, fascinated, though I think we all knew in our hearts that it was too late and that nothing could be done now. I could see by the expression on his face that he himself had little hope. Finally, he abandoned his task, shaking his head gravely. At that moment, we heard footsteps outside and Dr. Wilkins, Mrs. Inglethorpe's own doctor, a portly, fussy little man 
came bustling in. In a few words, Dr. Bowerstein explained how he had happened to be passing the lodge gates as the car came out and had run up to the house as fast as he could whilst the car went on to fetch Dr. Wilkins. With a faint gesture of the hand, he indicated the figure on the bed. V. Rye sad. V. Rye sad, murmured Dr. Wilkins. Poor dear lady, always did far too much, far too much, against my advice. I warned her, her heart was far from strong. Take it easy, I said to her. Take it easy, but no, her zeal for good works was too great. Nature rebelled, na, tur, re, belled. Dr. Bowerstein, I noticed, was watching the local doctor narrowly. He still kept his eyes fixed on him as he spoke. The convulsions were of a peculiar violence, Dr. Wilkins. I am sorry you were not here in time to witness them. They were quite tetanic in character. Ah, said Dr. Wilkins wisely. I should like to speak to you in private, said Dr. Bowerstein. He turned to John. You do not object? Certainly not. We all trooped out into the corridor, leaving the two doctors alone, and I heard the key turned in the lock behind us. We went slowly down the stairs. I was violently excited. I have a certain talent for deduction, and Dr. Bowerstein's manner had started a flock of wild surmises in my mind. Mary Cavendish laid her hand upon my arm. What is it? Why did Dr. Bowerstein seem so peculiar? I looked at her. Do you know what I think? What? Listen! I looked round. The others were out of earshot. I lowered my voice to a whisper. I believe she has been poisoned. I'm certain Dr. Bowerstein suspects it. What? She shrank against the wall, the pupils of her eyes dilating wildly. Then, with a sudden cry that startled me, she cried out, No, no, not that, not that, and breaking from me, fled up the stairs. I followed her, afraid that she was going to faint. I found her leaning against the banisters, deadly pale. She waved me away impatiently. No, no, leave me, I'd rather be alone. Let me just be quiet for a minute or two, go down to the others. I obeyed her reluctantly. John and Lawrence were in the dining room. I joined them. We were all silent, but I suppose I voiced the thoughts of us all when I at last broke it by saying, Where is Mr. Inglethorpe? John shook his head. He's not in the house. Our eyes met. Where was Alfred Inglethorpe? His absence was strange and inexplicable. I remembered Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words, what lay beneath them. What more could she have told us if she had had time? At last we heard the doctors descending the stairs. Dr. Wilkins was looking important and excited and trying to conceal an inward exultation under a manner of decorous calm. Dr. Bowerstein remained in the background, his grave bearded face unchanged. Dr. Wilkins was the spokesman for the two. He addressed himself to John. Mr. Cavendish, I should like your consent to a post-mortem. Is that necessary? asked John gravely. A spasm of pain crossed his face. Absolutely, said Dr. Bowerstein. You mean by that? That neither Dr. Wilkins nor myself could give a death certificate under the circumstances. John bent his head. In that case, I have no alternative but to agree. Thank you, said Dr. Wilkins briskly. We propose that it should take place tomorrow night, or rather, tonight. And he glanced at the daylight. Under the circumstances, I am afraid an inquest can hardly be avoided. These formalities are necessary, but I beg that you won't distress yourselves. There was a pause, and then Dr. Bowerstein drew two keys from his pocket and handed them to John. These are the keys of the two rooms. I have locked them, and in my opinion, they would be better kept locked for the present. The doctors then departed. I had been turning over an idea in my head, 
and I felt that the moment had now come to broach it. Yet I was a little chary of doing so. John, I knew, had a horror of any kind of publicity and was an easy-going optimist who preferred never to meet trouble halfway. It might be difficult to convince him of the soundness of my plan. Lawrence, on the other hand, being less conventional and having more imagination, I felt I might count upon as an ally. There was no doubt that the moment had come for me to take the lead. John, I said, I am going to ask you something. Well? You remember my speaking of my friend Poirot, the Belgian who is here? He has been a most famous detective. Yes? I want you to let me call him in, to investigate this matter. What, now, before the post-mortem? Yes, time is an advantage if, if there has been foul play. Rubbish, cried Lawrence angrily. In my opinion, the whole thing is a mare's nest of Bowersteins. Wilkins hadn't an idea of such a thing until Bowerstein put it into his head. But, like all specialists, Bowerstein's got a bee in his bonnet. Poisons are his hobby, so, of course, he sees them everywhere. I confess that I was surprised by Lawrence's attitude. He was so seldom vehement about anything. John hesitated. I can't feel as you do, Lawrence, he said at last. I'm inclined to give Hastings a free hand, though I should prefer to wait a bit. We don't want any unnecessary scandal. No, no, I cried eagerly. You need have no fear of that. Poirot is discretion itself. Very well, then. Have it your own way. I leave it in your hands. Though, if it is as we suspect, it seems a clear enough case. God forgive me if I am wronging him. I looked at my watch. It was six o'clock. I determined to lose no time. Five minutes' delay, however, I allowed myself. I spent it in ransacking the library until I discovered a medical book which gave a description of strychnine poisoning. Chapter 4 Poirot Investigates The house which the Belgians occupied in the village was quite close to the park gates. One could save time by taking a narrow path through the long grass which cut off the detours of the winding drive. So I, accordingly, went that way. I had nearly reached the lodge when my attention was arrested by the running figure of a man approaching me. It was Mr. Inglethorpe. Where had he been? How did he intend to explain his absence? He accosted me eagerly. My God, this is terrible. My poor wife, I have only just heard. Where have you been? I asked. Denby kept me late last night. It was one o'clock before we'd finished. Then I found that I'd forgotten the latch key after all. I didn't want to arouse the household, so Denby gave me a bed. How did you hear the news? I asked. Wilkins knocked Denby up to tell him. My poor Emily. She was so self-sacrificing. Such a noble character. She overtaxed her strength. A wave of revulsion swept over me. What a consummate hypocrite the man was. I must hurry on, I said, thankful that he did not ask me whither I was bound. In a few minutes, I was knocking at the door of Leastway's cottage. Getting no answer, I repeated my summons impatiently. A window above me was cautiously opened, and Poirot himself looked out. He gave an exclamation of surprise at seeing me. In a few brief words, I explained the tragedy that had occurred and that I wanted his help. Wait, my friend, I will let you in and you shall recount to me the affair whilst I dress. In a few moments, he had unbarred the door and I followed him up to his room. There he installed me in a chair and I related the whole story, keeping back nothing and omitting no circumstance, however insignificant, whilst he himself made a careful and deliberate toilet. I told him of my awakening, of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words, of her husband's absence, of the quarrel the day before, of the scrap of conversation between Mary and her mother-in-law that I had overheard, of the former quarrel between Mrs. Inglethorpe and Evelyn Howard,
and of the latter's innuendos. I was hardly as clear as I could wish. I repeated myself several times and occasionally had to go back to some detail that I had forgotten. Poirot smiled kindly on me. The mind is confused, is it not so? Take time, mon ami. You are agitated, you are excited. It is but natural. Presently, when we are calmer, we will arrange the facts, neatly, each in his proper place. We will examine and reject. Those of importance we will put on one side, those of no importance, poof. He screwed up his cherub-like face and puffed comically enough. Blow them away. That's all very well, I objected. But how are you going to decide what is important and what isn't? That always seems the difficulty to me. Poirot shook his head energetically. He was now arranging his moustache with exquisite care. Not so. Voyons. One fact leads to another, so we continue. Does the next fit in with that? A merveille. Good. We can proceed. This next little fact. No! Ah, that is curious. There is something missing. A link in the chain that is not there. We examine. We search. And that little curious fact, that possibly paltry little detail that will not tally, we put it here. He made an extravagant gesture with his hand. It is significant. It is tremendous. E S. Ah! Poirot shook his forefinger so fiercely at me that I quailed before it. Beware! Peril to the detective who says, it is so small, it does not matter. It will not agree, I will forget it. That way lies confusion. Everything matters. I know, you always told me that. That's why I have gone into all the details of this thing, whether they seemed to me relevant or not. And I am pleased with you. You have a good memory, and you have given me the facts faithfully. Of the order in which you present them, I say nothing. Truly, it is deplorable. But I make allowances. You are upset. To that I attribute the circumstance that you have omitted one fact of paramount importance. What is that? I asked. You have not told me if Mrs. Inglethorpe ate well last night. I stared at him. Surely the war had affected the little man's brain. He was carefully engaged in brushing his coat before putting it on and seemed wholly engrossed in the task. I don't remember, I said, and anyway, I don't see. You do not see, but it is of the first importance. I can't see why, I said, rather nettled. As far as I can remember, she didn't eat much. She was obviously upset, and it had taken her appetite away. That was only natural. Yes, said Poirot thoughtfully. It was only natural. He opened a drawer and took out a small dispatch case, then turned to me. Now I am ready. We will proceed to the chateau and study matters on the spot. Excuse me, mon ami, you dressed in haste and your tie is on one side. Permit me. With a deft gesture, he rearranged it. Ça y est. Now, shall we start? We hurried up the village and turned in at the lodge gates. Poirot stopped for a moment and gazed sorrowfully over the beautiful expanse of park, still glittering with morning dew. So beautiful, so beautiful, and yet the poor family plunged in sorrow, prostrated with grief. He looked at me keenly as he spoke, and I was aware that I reddened under his prolonged gaze. Was the family prostrated by grief? Was the sorrow at Mrs. Inglethorpe's death so great? I realised that there was an emotional lack in the atmosphere. The dead woman had not the gift of commanding love. Her death was a shock and a distress, but she would not be passionately regretted. Poirot seemed to follow my thoughts. He nodded his head gravely. No, you are right, he said. It is not as though there was a blood tie. She has been kind and generous to these Cavendishes, but she was not their own mother. Blood tells. Always remember that. Blood tells. Poirot, I said. 
I wish you would tell me why you wanted to know if Mrs. Inglethorpe ate well last night. I have been turning it over in my mind, but I can't see how it has anything to do with the matter. He was silent for a minute or two as we walked along, but finally he said, I do not mind telling you, though, as you know, it is not my habit to explain until the end is reached. The present contention is that Mrs. Inglethorpe died of strychnine poisoning, presumably administered in her coffee. Yes? Well, what time was the coffee served? About eight o'clock. Therefore, she drank it between then and half past eight, certainly not much later. Well, strychnine is a fairly rapid poison. Its effects would be felt very soon, probably in about an hour. Yet, in Mrs. Inglethorpe's case, the symptoms do not manifest themselves until five o'clock the next morning. Nine hours. But a heavy meal, taken at about the same time as the poison, might retard its effects, though hardly to that extent. Still, it is a possibility to be taken into account. But, according to you, she ate very little for supper, and yet the symptoms do not develop until early the next morning. Now, that is a curious circumstance, my friend. Something may arise at the autopsy to explain it. In the meantime, remember it. As we neared the house, John came out and met us. His face looked weary and haggard. This is a very dreadful business, Monsieur Poirot, he said. Hastings has explained to you that we are anxious for no publicity? I comprehend perfectly. You see, it is only suspicion so far. We have nothing to go upon. Precisely, it is a matter of precaution only. John turned to me, taking out his cigarette case and lighting a cigarette as he did so. You know that fellow Inglethorpe is back? Yes, I met him. John flung the match into an adjacent flower bed, a proceeding which was too much for Poirot's feelings. He retrieved it and buried it neatly. It's jolly difficult to know how to treat him. That difficulty will not exist long, pronounced Poirot quietly. John looked puzzled, not quite understanding the portent of this cryptic saying. He handed the two keys which Dr. Bowerstein had given him to me. Show Monsieur Poirot everything he wants to see. The rooms are locked? asked Poirot. Dr. Bauerstein considered it advisable. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Then he is very sure. Well, that simplifies matters for us. We went up together to the room of the tragedy. For convenience, I append a plan of the room and the principal articles of furniture in it. Poirot locked the door on the inside and proceeded to a minute inspection of the room. He darted from one object to the other with the agility of a grasshopper. I remained by the door, fearing to obliterate any clues. Poirot, however, did not seem grateful to me for my forbearance. What have you, my friend, he cried, that you remain there like, how do you say it? Ah, yes, the stuck pig. I explained that I was afraid of obliterating any footmarks. Footmarks? But what an idea! There has already been practically an army in the room. What footmarks are we likely to find? No, come here and aid me in my search. I will put down my little case until I need it. He did so, on the round table by the window, but it was an ill-advised proceeding. For the top of it being loose, it tilted up, and precipitated the dispatch case on the floor. Et voilà une table, cried Poirot. Ah, my friend, one may live in a big house and yet have no comfort. After which piece of moralizing, he resumed his search. A small purple dispatch case with a key in the lock on the writing table engaged his attention for some time. He took out the key from the lock and passed it to me to inspect. I saw nothing peculiar, however. It was an ordinary key of the Yale type, with a bit of twisted wire through the handle. Next, he examined the framework of the door we had broken in, assuring himself that the bolt had really been shot. Then he went to the door opposite 
leading into Cynthia's room. That door was also bolted, as I had stated. However, he went to the length of unbolting it and opening and shutting it several times. This he did with the utmost precaution against making any noise. Suddenly, something in the bolt itself seemed to rivet his attention. He examined it carefully, and then, nimbly whipping out a pair of small forceps from his case, he drew out some minute particle, which he carefully sealed up in a tiny envelope. On the chest of drawers, there was a tray with a spirit lamp and a small saucepan on it. A small quantity of a dark fluid remained in the saucepan, and an empty cup and saucer that had been drunk out of stood near it. I wondered how I could have been so unobservant as to overlook this. Here was a clue worth having. Poirot delicately dipped his finger into liquid and tasted it gingerly. He made a grimace. Cocoa! With, I think, rum in it. He passed on to the debris on the floor, where the table by the bed had been overturned. A reading lamp, some books, matches, a bunch of keys, and the crushed fragments of a coffee cup lay scattered about. Ah, this is curious, said Poirot. I must confess that I see nothing particularly curious about it. You do not. Observe the lamp. The chimney is broken in two places. They lie there as they fell. But see, the coffee cup is absolutely smashed to powder. Well, I said wearily. I suppose someone must have stepped on it. Exactly, said Poirot in an odd voice. Someone stepped on it. He rose from his knees and walked slowly across to the mantelpiece, where he stood abstractedly fingering the ornaments and straightening them, a trick of his when he was agitated. Mon ami, he said, turning to me, somebody stepped on that cup, grinding it to powder and the reason they did so was either because it contained strychnine or, which is far more serious, because it did not contain strychnine. I made no reply. I was bewildered, but I knew that it was no good asking him to explain. In a moment or two, he roused himself and went on with his investigations. He picked up the bunch of keys from the floor and twirling them round in his fingers, finally selected one, very bright and shining, which he tried in the lock of the purple dispatch case. It fitted, and he opened the box, but after a moment's hesitation, closed and relocked it, and slipped the bunch of keys, as well as the key that had originally stood in the lock, into his own pocket. I have no authority to go through these papers, but it should be done at once. He then made a very careful examination of the drawers of the washstand. Crossing the room to the left-hand window, a round stain, hardly visible on the dark brown carpet, seemed to interest him particularly. He went down on his knees, examining it minutely, even going so far as to smell it. Finally, he poured a few drops of the cocoa into a test tube, sealing it up carefully. His next proceeding was to take out a little notebook. We have found in this room, he said, writing busily, six points of interest. Shall I enumerate them, or will you? Oh, you, I replied hastily. Very well then. One, a coffee cup that has been ground into powder. Two, a dispatch case with a key in the lock. Three, a stain on the floor. That may have been done some time ago, I interrupted. No, for it is still perceptibly damp and smells of coffee. Four, a fragment of some dark green fabric, only a thread or two, but recognisable. Ah, I cried. That was what you sealed up in the envelope. Yes, it may turn out to be a piece of one of Mrs Inglethorpe's own dresses, and quite unimportant. We shall see. Five, this. With a dramatic gesture, he pointed to a large splash of candle grease on the floor by the writing table. It must have been done since yesterday, otherwise a good housemaid would have at once removed it with blotting paper 
and a hot iron. One of my best hats once, but that is not to the point. It was very likely done last night. We were very agitated. Or perhaps Mrs. Inglethorpe herself dropped her candle. You brought only one candle into the room? Yes, Lawrence Cavendish was carrying it, but he was very upset. He seemed to see something over here, I indicated the mantelpiece, that absolutely paralysed him. That is interesting, said Poirot quickly. Yes, it is suggestive, his eye sweeping the whole length of the wall. But it was not his candle that made this great patch, for you perceive that this is white grease, whereas Monsieur Lawrence's candle, which is still on the dressing table, is pink. On the other hand, Mrs. Inglethorpe had no candlestick in the room, only a reading lamp. Then, I said, what do you deduce? To which my friend only made a rather irritating reply, urging me to use my own natural faculties. And the sixth point? I asked. I suppose it is the sample of cocoa. No, said Poirot thoughtfully. I might have included that in the six, but I did not. No, the sixth point I will keep to myself for the present. He looked quickly round the room. There is nothing more to be done here, I think, unless... He stared earnestly and long at the dead ashes in the grate. The fire burns and it destroys. But by chance, there might be, let us see. Deftly, on hands and knees, he began to sort the ashes from the grate into the fender, handling them with the greatest caution. Suddenly, he gave a faint exclamation. The forceps! Hastings! I quickly handed them to him, and with skill he extracted a small piece of half-charred paper. There, mon ami, he cried. What do you think of that? I scrutinized the fragment. This is an exact reproduction of it. I was puzzled. It was unusually thick, quite unlike ordinary notepaper. Suddenly, an idea struck me. Poirot, I cried. This is a fragment of a will. Exactly. I looked up at him sharply. You are not surprised? No, he said gravely. I expected it. I relinquished the piece of paper and watched him put it away in his case with the same methodical care that he bestowed on everything. My brain was in a whirl. What was this complication of a will? Who had destroyed it? The person who had left the candle grease on the floor? Obviously. But how had anyone gained admission? All the doors had been bolted on the inside. Now, my friend, said Poirot briskly, we will go. I should like to ask a few questions of the parlour maid. Dorcas, her name is, is it not? We passed through Alfred Inglethorpe's room, and Poirot delayed long enough to make a brief but fairly comprehensive examination of it. We went out through that door, locking both it and that of Mrs. Inglethorpe's room as before. I took him down to the boudoir, which he had expressed a wish to see, and went myself in search of Dorcas. When I returned with her, however, the boudoir was empty. Poirot, I cried, where are you? I am here, my friend. He had stepped outside the French window and was standing, apparently lost in admiration, before the various shaped flower beds. Admirable, he murmured. Admirable? What symmetry? Observe that crescent and those diamonds. Their neatness rejoices the eye. The spacing of the plants also is perfect. It has been recently done. Is it not so? Yes, I believe they were at it yesterday afternoon. But come in. Dorcas is here. Eh bien, eh bien, do not grudge me a moment's satisfaction of the eye. Yes, but this affair is more important. And how do you know that these fine begonias are not of equal importance? I shrugged my shoulders. There was really no arguing with him if he chose to take that line. You do not agree, 
but such things have been. Well, we will come in and interview the brave Dorcas. Dorcas was standing in the boudoir, her hands folded in front of her, and her grey hair rose in stiff waves under her white cap. She was the very model and picture of a good old-fashioned servant. In her attitude towards Poirot, she was inclined to be suspicious, but he soon broke down her defences. He drew forward a chair. Pray be seated, mademoiselle. Thank you, sir. You have been with your mistress many years, is it not so? Ten years, sir. That is a long time and very faithful service. You were much attached to her, were you not? She was a very good mistress to me, sir. Then you will not object to answering a few questions. I put them to you with Mr. Cavendish's full approval. Oh, certainly, sir. Then I will begin by asking you about the events of yesterday afternoon. Your mistress had a quarrel? Yes, sir, but I don't know that I ought... Dorcas hesitated. Poirot looked at her keenly. My good Dorcas, it is necessary that I should know every detail of that quarrel as fully as possible. Do not think that you are betraying your mistress's secrets. Your mistress lies dead, and it is necessary that we should know all if we are to avenge her. Nothing can bring her back to life, but we do hope, if there has been foul play, to bring the murderer to justice. Amen to that, said Dorcas fiercely, and naming no names, there's one in this house that none of us could ever abide, and an ill day it was when first he darkened the threshold. Poirot waited for her indignation to subside, and then, resuming his businesslike tone, he asked, Now, as to this quarrel, what is the first you heard of it? Well, sir, I happened to be going along the hall outside yesterday. What time was that? I couldn't say exactly, sir, but it wasn't tea time by a long way. Perhaps four o'clock, or it may have been a bit later. Well, sir, as I said, I happened to be passing along when I heard voices very loud and angry in here. I didn't exactly mean to listen, but, well, there it is. I stopped. The door was shut, but the mistress was speaking very sharp and clear, and I heard what she said quite plainly. You have lied to me and deceived me, she said. I didn't hear what Mr. Inglethorpe replied. He spoke a good bit lower than she did, but she answered, How dare you? I have kept you and clothed you and fed you. You owe everything to me, and this is how you repay me by bringing disgrace upon our name. Again, I didn't hear what he said, but she went on. Nothing that you can say will make any difference. I see my duty clearly. My mind is made up. You need not think that any fear of publicity or scandal between husband and wife will deter me. Then I thought I heard them coming out, so I went off quickly. You are sure it was Mr. Inglethorpe's voice you heard? Oh, yes, sir. Whose else's could it be? Well, what happened next? Later, I came back to the hall, but it was all quiet. At five o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe rang the bell and told me to bring her a cup of tea, nothing to eat, to the boudoir. She was looking dreadful, so white and upset. Dorcas, she says, I've had a great shock. I'm sorry for that, mum, I says. You'll feel better after a nice hot cup of tea, mum. She had something in her hand. I don't know if it was a letter or just a piece of paper, but it had writing on it, and she kept staring at it, almost as if she couldn't believe what was written there. She whispered to herself, as though she had forgotten I was there. These few words, and everything's changed. And then she says to me, Never trust a man, Dorcas, they're not worth it. I hurried off and got her a good strong cup of tea, and she thanked me and said she'd feel better when she'd drunk it. I don't know what to do, she says. Scandal between husband and wife is a dreadful thing, Dorcas. I'd rather hush it up if I could.
Mrs. Cavendish came in just then, so she didn't say any more. She still had the letter, or whatever it was, in her hand. Yes, sir. What would she be likely to do with it afterwards? Well, I don't know, sir. I expect she would lock it up in that purple case of hers. Is that where she usually kept important papers? Yes, sir. She brought it down with her every morning and took it up every night. When did she lose the key of it? She missed it yesterday at lunchtime, sir, and told me to look carefully for it. She was very much put out about it. But she had a duplicate key? Oh, yes, sir. Dorcas was looking very curiously at him, and, to tell the truth, so was I. What was all this about a lost key? Poirot smiled. Never mind, Dorcas, it is my business to know things. Is this the key that was lost? He drew from his pocket the key that he had found in the lock of the dispatch case upstairs. Dorcas's eyes looked as though they would pop out of her head. That's it, sir, right enough. But where did you find it? I looked everywhere for it. Ah, but you see it was not in the same place yesterday as it was today. Now, to pass to another subject, had your mistress a dark green dress in her wardrobe? Dorcas was rather startled by the unexpected question. No, sir. Are you quite sure? Oh, yes, sir. Has anyone else in the house got a green dress? Dorcas reflected. Miss Cynthia has a green evening dress. Light or dark green? A light green, sir. A sort of chiffon, they call it. Ah, that is not what I want. And nobody else has anything green? No, sir, not that I know of. Poirot's face did not betray a trace of whether he was disappointed or otherwise. He merely remarked, Good, we will leave that and pass on. Have you any reason to believe that your mistress was likely to take a sleeping powder last night? Not last night, sir, I know she didn't. Why do you know so positively? Because the box was empty. She took the last one two days ago and she didn't have any more made up. You are quite sure of that? Positive, sir. Then that is cleared up. By the way, your mistress didn't ask you to sign any paper yesterday. To sign a paper? No, sir. When Mr. Hastings and Mr. Lawrence came in yesterday evening, they found your mistress busy writing letters. I suppose you can give me no idea to whom these letters were addressed. I'm afraid I couldn't, sir. I was out in the evening. Perhaps Annie could tell you, though she's a careless girl. Never cleared the coffee cups away last night. That's what happens when I'm not here to look after things. Poirot lifted his hand. Since they have been left, Dorcas, leave them a little longer, I pray you. I should like to examine them. Very well, sir. What time did you go out last evening? About six o'clock, sir. Thank you, Dorcas. That is all I have to ask you. He rose and strolled to the window. I have been admiring these flower beds. How many gardeners are employed here, by the way? Only three now, sir. Five, we had before the war, when it was kept as a gentleman's place should be. I wish you could have seen it then, sir. A fair sight it was. But now there's only old Manning and young William and a new-fashioned woman gardener in breeches and such like. Ah, these are dreadful times. The good times will come again, Dorcas. At least we hope so. Now, will you send Annie to me here? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. How did you know that Mrs. Inglethorpe took sleeping powders? I asked, in lively curiosity, as Dorcas left the room. And about the lost key and the duplicate? One thing at a time. As to the sleeping powders, I knew by this. He suddenly produced a small cardboard box, such as chemists use for powders. Where did you find it? In the washstand drawer in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom. It was number six of my catalogue. But I suppose, 
as the last powder was taken two days ago, it is not of much importance. Probably not, but do you notice anything that strikes you as peculiar about this box? I examined it closely. No, I can't say that I do. Look at the label. I read the label carefully. One powder to be taken at bedtime if required. Mrs. Inglethorpe. No, I see nothing unusual. Not the fact that there is no chemist's name. Ah, I exclaimed. To be sure, that is odd. Have you ever known a chemist to send out a box like that without his printed name? No, I can't say that I have. I was becoming quite excited, but Poirot damped my ardour by remarking, Yet the explanation is quite simple. So do not intrigue yourself, my friend. An audible creaking proclaimed the approach of Annie, so I had no time to reply. Annie was a fine, strapping girl and was evidently labouring under intense excitement, mingled with a certain ghoulish enjoyment of the tragedy. Poirot came to the point at once with a business-like briskness. I sent for you, Annie, because I thought you might be able to tell me something about the letters Mrs. and Inglethorpe wrote last night. How many were there? And can you tell me any of the names and addresses? Annie considered. There were four letters, sir. One was to Miss Howard and one was to Mr. Wells, the lawyer, and the other two, I don't think I remember, sir. Oh, yes, one was to Ross's, the caterers in Tadminster. The other one, I don't remember. Think, urged Poirot. Annie racked her brains in vain. I'm sorry, sir, but it's clean gone. I don't think I can have noticed it. It does not matter, said Poirot, not betraying any sign of disappointment. Now I want to ask you about something else. There is a saucepan in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room with some cocoa in it. Did she have that every night? Yes, sir. It was put in her room every evening, and she warmed it up in the night whenever she fancied it. What was it? Plain cocoa? Yes, sir. Made with milk, with a teaspoonful of sugar, and two teaspoonfuls of rum in it. Who took it to her room? I did, sir. Always? Yes, sir. At what time? When I went to draw the curtains, as a rule, sir. Did you bring it straight up from the kitchen, then? No, sir, you see there's not much room on the gas stove, so Cook used to make it early before putting the vegetables on for supper. Then I used to bring it up and put it on the table by the swing door and take it into her room later. The swing door is in the left wing, is it not? Yes, sir. And the table? Is it on this side of the door or on the farther servant's side? It's this side, sir. What time did you bring it up last night? About quarter past seven, I should say, sir. And when did you take it into Mrs. Inglethorpe's room? When I went to shut up, sir, about eight o'clock. Mrs. Inglethorpe came up to bed before I'd finished. Then, between 7.15 and eight o'clock, the cocoa was standing on the table in the left wing. Yes, sir. Annie had been growing redder and redder in the face, and now she blurted out unexpectedly. And if there was salt in it, sir, it wasn't me. I never took the salt near it. What makes you think there was salt in it? asked Poirot. Seeing it on the tray, sir. You saw some salt on the tray? Yes, coarse kitchen salt it looked. I never noticed it when I took the tray up, but when I came to take it into the mistress's room, I saw it at once, and I suppose I ought to have taken it down again and asked Cook to make some fresh. But I was in a hurry, because Dorcas was out, and I thought maybe the cocoa itself was all right, and the salt had only gone on the tray. So I dusted it off with my apron and took it in. I had the utmost difficulty in controlling my excitement. Unknown to herself, Annie had provided us with an important piece of evidence. How she would have gaped if she had realised that her coarse kitchen salt was strychnine 
one of the most deadly poisons known to mankind. I marvelled at Poirot's calm. His self-control was astonishing. I awaited his next question with impatience, but it disappointed me. When you went into Mrs Inglethorpe's room, was the door leading into Miss Cynthia's room bolted? Oh, yes, sir. It always was. It had never been opened. And the door into Mr Inglethorpe's room? Did you notice if that was bolted too? Annie hesitated. I couldn't rightly say, sir. It was shut, but I couldn't say whether it was bolted or not. When you finally left the room, did Mrs Inglethorpe bolt the door after you? No, sir, not then. But I expect she did later. She usually did lock it at night. The door into the passage, that is. Did you notice any candle grease on the floor when you did the room yesterday? Candle grease? Oh, no, sir. Mrs Inglethorpe didn't have a candle, only a reading lamp. Then, if there had been a large patch of candle grease on the floor, you think you would have been sure to have seen it? Yes, sir, and I would have taken it out with a piece of blotting paper and a hot iron. Then Poirot repeated the question he had put to Dorcas. Did your mistress ever have a green dress? No, sir. Nor a mantle, nor a cape, nor a, how do you call it, a sports coat. Not green, sir. Nor anyone else in the house? Annie reflected. No, sir. You are sure of that? Quite sure. Bien, that is all I want to know. Thank you very much. With a nervous giggle, Annie took herself creakingly out of the room. My pent-up excitement burst forth. Poirot, I cried. I congratulate you. This is a great discovery. What is a great discovery? Why, that it was the cocoa and not the coffee that was poisoned. That explains everything. Of course, it did not take effect until the early morning, since the cocoa was only drunk in the middle of the night. So you think that the cocoa, Markwell, what I say, Hastings, the cocoa, contained strychnine? Of course, that salt on the tray, what else could it have been? It might have been salt, replied Poirot placidly. I shrugged my shoulders. If he was going to take the matter that way, it was no good arguing with him. The idea crossed my mind, not for the first time, that poor old Poirot was growing old. Privately, I thought it lucky that he had associated with him someone of a more receptive type of mind. Poirot was surveying me with quietly twinkling eyes. You are not pleased with me, mon ami. My dear Poirot, I said coldly, it is not for me to dictate to you. You have a right to your own opinion, just as I have to mine. A most admirable sentiment, remarked Poirot, rising briskly to his feet. Now I have finished with this room. By the way, whose is the smaller desk in the corner? Mr. Inglethorpe's. Ah, he tried the roll top tentatively, locked. But perhaps one of Mrs. Inglethorpe's keys would open it. He tried several twisting and turning them with a practised hand and finally uttering an ejaculation of satisfaction. Voila, it is not the key, but it will open it at a pinch. He slid back the roll top and ran a rapid eye over the neatly filed papers. To my surprise, he did not examine them, merely remarking approvingly as he relocked the desk. Decidedly, he is a man of method, this Mr. Inglethorpe. A man of method was, in Poirot's estimation, the highest praise that could be bestowed on any individual. I felt that my friend was not what he had been as he rambled on disconnectedly. There were no stamps in his desk, but there might have been, eh, mon ami? There might have been? Yes, his eyes wandered around the room. This boudoir has nothing more to tell us. It did not yield much, only this. He pulled a crumpled envelope out of his pocket and tossed it over to me. It was rather a curious document, a plain, dirty-looking old envelope with a few words scrawled across it. 
apparently at random. The following is a facsimile of it. Chapter 5 It isn't Stritch 9, is it? Where did you find this? I asked Poirot, in lively curiosity. In the waste paper basket. You recognise the handwriting? Yes, it is Mrs Inglethorpe's, but what does it mean? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. I cannot say, but it is suggestive. A wild idea flashed across me. Was it possible that Mrs Inglethorpe's mind was deranged? Had she some fantastic idea of demoniacal possession? And, if that was so, was it not also possible that she might have taken her own life? I was about to expound these theories to Poirot when his own words distracted me. Come, he said, now to examine the coffee cups. My dear Poirot, what on earth is the good of that, now that we know about the cocoa? Oh, la, la, that miserable cocoa, cried Poirot flippantly. He laughed with apparent enjoyment, raising his arms to heaven in mock despair in what I could not but consider the worst possible taste. And anyway, I said with increasing coldness, as Mrs. Inglethorpe took her coffee upstairs with her, I do not see what you expect to find, unless you consider it likely that we shall discover a packet of strychnine on the coffee tray. Poirot was sobered at once. Come, come, my friend, he said, slipping his arms through mine. Ne vous fâchez pas. Allow me to interest myself in my coffee cups, and I will respect your cocoa. There, is it a bargain? He was so quaintly humorous that I was forced to laugh, and we went together to the drawing room, where the coffee cups and tray remained undisturbed as we had left them. Poirot made me recapitulate the scene of the night before, listening very carefully and verifying the position of the various cups. So Mrs. Cavendish stood by the tray and poured out. Yes. Then she came across to the window where you sat with Mademoiselle Cynthia. Yes. Here are the three cups, and the cup on the mantelpiece, half drunk, that would be Mr. Lawrence Cavendish's, and the one on the tray. John Cavendish's. I saw him put it down there. Good. One, two, three, four, five. But where, then, is the cup of Mr. Inglethorpe? He does not take coffee. Then all are accounted for. One moment, my friend. With infinite care, he took a drop or two from the grounds in each cup, sealing them up in separate test tubes, tasting each in turn as he did so. His physiognomy underwent a curious change, an expression gathered there that I can only describe as half puzzled and half relieved. Bien! he said at last. It is evident. I had an idea, but clearly I was mistaken. Yes, altogether I was mistaken. Yet it is strange, but no matter. And, with a characteristic shrug, he dismissed whatever it was that was worrying him from his mind. I could have told him from the beginning that this obsession of his over the coffee was bound to end in a blind alley, but I restrained my tongue. After all, though he was old, Poirot had been a great man in his day. Breakfast is ready, said John Cavendish, coming in from the hall. You will breakfast with us, Monsieur Poirot? Poirot acquiesced. I observed John. Already he was almost restored to his normal self. The shock of the events of the last night had upset him temporarily, but his equable poise soon swung back to the normal. He was a man of very little imagination, in sharp contrast with his brother, who had, perhaps, too much. Ever since the early hours of the morning, John had been hard at work, sending telegrams, one of the first had gone to Evelyn Howard, writing notices for the papers, and generally occupying himself with the melancholy duties that a death entails. May I ask how things are proceeding, he said. Do your investigations point to my mother having died a natural death? Or, or must we prepare ourselves for the worst? I think, Mr. Cavendish, said Poirot gravely, 
that you would do well not to buoy yourself up with any false hopes. Can you tell me the views of the other members of the family? My brother Lawrence is convinced that we are making a fuss over nothing. He says that everything points to its being a simple case of heart failure. He does, does he? That is very interesting. Very interesting, murmured Poirot softly. And Mrs Cavendish? A faint cloud passed over John's face. I have not the least idea what my wife's views on the subject are. The answer brought a momentary stiffness in its train. John broke the rather awkward silence by saying with a slight effort, I told you, didn't I, that Mr Inglethorpe has returned? Poirot bent his head. It's an awkward position for all of us. Of course one has to treat him as usual, but hang it all, one's gorge does rise at sitting down to eat with a possible murderer. Poirot nodded sympathetically. I quite understand. It is a very difficult situation for you, Mr Cavendish. I would like to ask you one question. Mr Inglethorpe's reason for not returning last night was, I believe, that he had forgotten the latch key. Is not that so? Yes. I suppose you are quite sure that the latch key was forgotten, that he did not take it after all. I have no idea. I never thought of looking. We always keep it in the hall drawer. I'll go and see if it's there now. Poirot held up his hand with a faint smile. No, no, Mr Cavendish, it is too late now. I am certain that you would find it. If Mr Inglethorpe did take it, he has had ample time to replace it by now. But do you think? I think nothing. If anyone had chanced to look this morning before his return and seen it there, it would have been a valuable point in his favour. That is all. John looked perplexed. Do not worry, said Poirot smoothly. I assure you that you need not let it trouble you. Since you are so kind, let us go and have some breakfast. Everyone was assembled in the dining room. Under the circumstances, we were naturally not a cheerful party. The reaction after a shock is always trying, and I think we were all suffering from it. Decorum and good breeding naturally enjoined that our demeanour should be much as usual, yet I could not help wondering if this self-control were really a matter of great difficulty. There were no red eyes, no signs of secretly indulged grief. I felt that I was right in my opinion, that Dorcas was the person most affected by the personal side of the tragedy. I pass over Alfred Inglethorpe, who acted the bereaved widower in a manner that I felt to be disgusting in its hypocrisy. Did he know that we suspected him? I wondered. Surely he could not be unaware of the fact, conceal it as we would. Did he feel some secret stirring of fear? Or was he confident that his crime would go unpunished? Surely the suspicion in the atmosphere must warn him that he was already a marked man. But did everyone suspect him? What about Mrs. Cavendish? I watched her as she sat at the head of the table, graceful, composed, enigmatic. In her soft grey frock, with white ruffles at the wrists falling over her slender hands, she looked very beautiful. When she chose, however, her face could be sphinx-like in its inscrutability. She was very silent, hardly opening her lips, and yet in some queer way, I felt that the great strength of her personality was dominating us all. And little Cynthia, did she suspect? She looked very tired and ill, I thought. The heaviness and languor of her manner were very marked. I asked her if she were feeling ill, and she answered frankly, Yes, I've got the most beastly headache. Have another cup of coffee, mademoiselle, said Poirot solicitously. It will revive you. It is unparalleled for the mal de tête. He jumped up and took her cup. No sugar, said Cynthia, watching him as he picked up the sugar tongs. No sugar? You abandon it in the wartime, eh? No, I never take it in coffee, 
Sacré, murmured Poirot to himself as he brought back the replenished cup. Only I heard him, and glancing up curiously at the little man, I saw that his face was working with suppressed excitement, and his eyes were as green as a cat's. He had heard or seen something that had affected him strongly, but what was it? I do not usually label myself as dense, but I must confess that nothing out of the ordinary had attracted my attention. In another moment, the door opened and Dorcas appeared. Mr. Wells to see you, sir, she said to John. I remembered the name as being that of the lawyer to whom Mrs. Inglethorpe had written the night before. John rose immediately. Show him into my study. Then he turned to us. My mother's lawyer, he explained, and in a lower voice, he is also coroner. You understand. Perhaps you would like to come with me. We acquiesced and followed him out of the room. John strode on ahead and I took the opportunity of whispering to Poirot, There will be an inquest then? Poirot nodded absently. He seemed absorbed in thought, so much so that my curiosity was aroused. What is it? You are not attending to what I say. It is true, my friend. I am much worried. Why? Because Mademoiselle Cynthia does not take sugar in her coffee. What? You cannot be serious. But I am most serious. Ah, there is something there that I do not understand. My instinct was right. What instinct? The instinct that led me to insist on examining those coffee cups. Chut! No more now. We followed John into his study and he closed the door behind us. Mr. Wells was a pleasant man of middle age, with keen eyes and the typical lawyer's mouth. John introduced us both and explained the reason of our presence. You will understand, Wells, he added, that this is all strictly private. We are still hoping that there will turn out to be no need for investigation of any kind. Quite so, quite so said Mr. Wells, soothingly. I wish we could have spared you the pain and publicity of an inquest, but of course it's quite unavoidable in the absence of a doctor's certificate. Yes, I suppose so. Clever man, Bauerstein. Great authority on toxicology, I believe. Indeed, said John, with a certain stiffness in his manner. Then he added rather hesitatingly, Shall we have to appear as witnesses? All of us, I mean. You. Of course. And, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Inglethorpe. A slight pause ensued before the lawyer went on in his soothing manner. Any other evidence will be simply confirmatory, a mere matter of form. I see. A faint expression of relief swept over John's face. It puzzled me, for I saw no occasion for it. If you know of nothing to the contrary, pursued Mr. Wells, I had thought of Friday. That will give us plenty of time for the doctor's report. The post-mortem is to take place tonight, I believe. Yes. Then that arrangement will suit you? Perfectly. I need not tell you, my dear Cavendish, how distressed I am at this most tragic affair. Can you give us no help in solving it, monsieur? interposed Poirot, speaking for the first time since we had entered the room. I, yes, we heard that Mrs. Inglethorpe wrote to you last night. You should have received the letter this morning. I did, but it contains no information. It is merely a note asking me to call upon her this morning, as she wanted my advice on a matter of great importance. She gave you no hint as to what that matter might be? Unfortunately, no. That is a pity, said John. A great pity, agreed Poirot gravely. There was silence. Poirot remained lost in thought for a few minutes. Finally, he turned to the lawyer again. Mr. Wells, there is one thing I should like to ask you, that is, if it is not against professional etiquette. In the event of Mrs. Inglethorpe's death, 
who would inherit her money? The lawyer hesitated a moment and then replied, The knowledge will be public property very soon, so if Mr Cavendish does not object... Not at all, interpolated John. I do not see any reason why I should not answer your question. By her last will, dated August of last year, after various unimportant legacies to servants, etc., she gave her entire fortune to her stepson, Mr. John Cavendish. Was not that, pardon the question, Mr. Cavendish, rather unfair to her other stepson, Mr. Lawrence Cavendish? No, I do not think so. You see, under the terms of their father's will, while John inherited the property, Lawrence, at his stepmother's death, would come into a considerable sum of money. Mrs. Inglethorpe left her money to her elder stepson, knowing that he would have to keep up styles. It was, to my mind, a very fair and equitable distribution. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. I see. But I am right in saying, am I not, that by your English law that will was automatically revoked when Mrs. Inglethorpe remarried? Mr. Wells bowed his head. As I was about to proceed, Monsieur Poirot, that document is now null and void. Huh? said Poirot. He reflected for a moment and then asked, Was Mrs. Inglethorpe herself aware of that fact? I do not know. She may have been. She was, said John unexpectedly. We were discussing the matter of wills being revoked by marriage only yesterday. Ah, one more question, Mr. Wells. You say her last will. Had Mrs. Inglethorpe then made several former wills? On an average, she made a new will at least once a year, said Mr. Wells imperturbably. She was given to changing her mind as to her testamentary dispositions, now benefiting one, now another member of her family. Suppose, suggested Poirot, that unknown to you, she had made a new will in favour of someone who was not, in any sense of the word, a member of the family. We will say, Miss Howard, for instance. Would you be surprised? Not in the least. Ah, Poirot seemed to have exhausted his questions. I drew close to him while John and the lawyer were debating the question of going through Mrs. Inglethorpe's papers. Do you think Mrs. Inglethorpe made a will leaving all her money to Miss Howard? I asked in a low voice, with some curiosity. Poirot smiled. No. Then why did you ask? Hush. John Cavendish had turned to Poirot. Will you come with us, Monsieur Poirot? We are going through my mother's papers. Mr. Inglethorpe is quite willing to leave it entirely to Mr. Wells and myself. Which simplifies matters very much, murmured the lawyer. As technically, of course, he was entitled. He did not finish the sentence. We will look through the desk in the boudoir first, explained John, and go up to her bedroom afterwards. She kept her most important papers in a purple dispatch case, which we must look through carefully. Yes, said the lawyer, it is quite possible that there may be a later will than the one in my possession. There is a later will? It was Poirot who spoke. What? John and the lawyer looked at him startled. Or rather, pursued my friend imperturbably, there was one. What do you mean, there was one? Where is it now? Burnt. Burnt? Yes, see here. He took out the charred fragment we had found in the grate in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room and handed it to the lawyer with a brief explanation of when and where he had found it. But possibly this is an old will. I do not think so. In fact, I am almost certain that it was made no earlier than yesterday afternoon. What? Impossible, broke simultaneously from both men. Poirot turned to John. If you will allow me to send for your gardener, I will prove it to you. Oh, of course, but I don't see... Ah, uh, Poirot raised his hand. Do as I ask you, 
Afterwards you shall question as much as you please. Very well. He rang the bell. Dorcas answered it in due course. Dorcas, will you tell Manning to come round and speak to me here? Yes, sir. Dorcas withdrew. We waited in a tense silence. Poirot alone seemed perfectly at his ease and dusted a forgotten corner of the bookcase. The clumping of hobnailed boots on the gravel outside proclaimed the approach of Manning. John looked questioningly at Poirot. The latter nodded. Come inside, Manning, said John. I want to speak to you. Manning came slowly and hesitatingly through the French window and stood as near it as he could. He held his cap in his hands, twisting it very carefully round and round. His back was much bent, though he was probably not as old as he looked, but his eyes were sharp and intelligent and belied his slow and rather cautious speech. Manning, said John, this gentleman will put some questions to you which I want you to answer. Yes, sir, mumbled Manning. Poirot stepped forward briskly. Manning's eye swept over him with a faint contempt. You were planting a bed of begonias round by the south side of the house yesterday afternoon, were you not, Manning? Yes, sir, me and Willem. And Mrs. Inglethorpe came to the window and called you, did she not? Yes, sir, she did. Tell me in your own words exactly what happened after that. Well, sir, nothing much. She just told Willem to go on his bicycle down to the village and bring back a form of will or such like. I don't know what exactly. She wrote it down for him. Well? Well, he did, sir. And what happened next? We went on with the begonias, sir. Did not Mrs. Inglethorpe call you again? Yes, sir. Both me and Willem, she called. And then? She made us come right in and sign our names at the bottom of a long paper, under where she'd signed. Did you see anything of what was written above her signature? asked Poirot sharply. No, sir. There was a bit of blotting paper over that part. And you signed where she told you? Yes, sir. First me, and then Willem. What did she do with it afterwards? Well, sir, she slipped it into a long envelope and put it inside a sort of purple box that was standing on the desk. What time was it when she first called you? About four, I should say, sir. Not earlier. Couldn't it have been about half past three? No, I shouldn't say so, sir. It would be more likely to be a bit after four, not before it. Thank you, Manning. That will do, said Poirot pleasantly. The gardener glanced at his master, who nodded, whereupon Manning lifted a finger to his forehead with a low mumble and backed cautiously out of the window. We all looked at each other. Good heavens, murmured John. What an extraordinary coincidence. How, a coincidence? That my mother should have made a will on the very day of her death. Mr. Wells cleared his throat and remarked dryly, Are you so sure it is a coincidence, Cavendish? What do you mean? Your mother, you tell me, had a violent quarrel with someone yesterday afternoon. What do you mean? cried John again. There was a tremor in his voice, and he had gone very pale. In consequence of that quarrel, your mother very suddenly and hurriedly makes a new will. The contents of that will we shall never know. She told no one of its provisions. This morning, no doubt, she would have consulted me on the subject, but she had no chance. The will disappears, and she takes its secret with her to her grave. Cavendish, I much fear there is no coincidence there. Monsieur Poirot, I am sure you agree with me that the facts are very suggestive. Suggestive or not, interrupted John. We are most grateful to Monsieur Poirot for elucidating the matter. But for him we should never have known of this will. I suppose I may not ask you, Monsieur, what first led you to suspect the fact? Poirot smiled and answered. <laughs>
a scribbled over old envelope and a freshly planted bed of begonias. John, I think, would have pressed his questions further, but at that moment the loud purr of a motor was audible and we all turned to the window as it swept past. Evie, cried John. Excuse me, Wells. He went hurriedly out into the hall. Poirot looked inquiringly at me. Miss Howard, I explained. Ah, I am glad she has come. There is a woman with a head and a heart too, Hastings, though the good God gave her no beauty. I followed John's example and went out into the hall where Miss Howard was endeavouring to extricate herself from the voluminous mass of veils that enveloped her head. As her eyes fell on me, a sudden pang of guilt shot through me. This was the woman who had warned me so earnestly and to whose warning I had, alas, paid no heed. How soon and how contemptuously I had dismissed it from my mind. Now that she had been proved justified in so tragic a manner, I felt ashamed. She had known Alfred Inglethorpe only too well. I wondered whether, if she had remained at Stiles, the tragedy would have taken place or would the man have feared her watchful eyes? I was relieved when she shook me by the hand with her well-remembered painful grip. The eyes that met mine were sad, but not reproachful. That she had been crying bitterly, I could tell by the redness of her eyelids, but her manner was unchanged from its old gruffness. Started the moment I got the wire. Just come off night duty. Hired car quickest way to get here. Have you had anything to eat this morning, Evie? asked John. No, I thought not. Come along, breakfast's not cleared away yet and they'll make you some fresh tea, he turned to me. Look after her, Hastings, will you? Wells is waiting for me. Oh, here's Monsieur Poirot. He's helping us, you know, Evie. Miss Howard shook hands with Poirot, but glanced suspiciously over her shoulder at John. What do you mean, helping us? Helping us to investigate? Nothing to investigate. Have they taken him to prison yet? Taken who to prison? Who? Alfred Inglethorpe, of course. My dear Evie, do be careful. Lawrence is of the opinion that my mother died from heart seizure. More fool, Lawrence, retorted Miss Howard. Of course Alfred Inglethorpe murdered poor Emily as I always told you he would. My dear Evie, don't shout so. Whatever we may think or suspect, it is better to say as little as possible for the present. The inquest isn't until Friday. Not until fiddlesticks. The snort Miss Howard gave was truly magnificent. You're all off your heads. The man will be out of the country by then. If he's any sense, he won't stay here tamely and wait to be hanged. John Cavendish looked at her helplessly. I know what it is, she accused him. You've been listening to the doctors, never should. What do they know? Nothing at all, or just enough to make them dangerous. I ought to know, my own father was a doctor. That little Wilkins is about the greatest fool that even I have ever seen. Heart seizure. Sort of thing, he would say. Anyone with any sense could see at once that her husband had poisoned her. I always said he'd murder her in her bed, poor soul. Now he's done it, and all you can do is to murmur silly things about heart seizure and inquest on Friday. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, John Cavendish. What do you want me to do? asked John, unable to help a faint smile. Dash it all, Evie. I can't haul him down to the local police station by the scruff of his neck. Well, you might do something. Find out how he did it. He's a crafty beggar. Dare say he's soaked flypapers. Ask Cook if she's missed any. It occurred to me very forcibly at that moment that to harbour Miss Howard and Alfred Inglethorpe under the same roof and keep the peace between them was likely to prove a Herculean task and I did not envy John. I could see by the expression of his face that he fully appreciated the difficulty of the position.
For the moment, he sought refuge in retreat and left the room precipitately. Dorcas brought in fresh tea. As she left the room, Poirot came over from the window where he had been standing and sat down facing Miss Howard. Mademoiselle, he said gravely, I want to ask you something. Ask away, said the lady, eyeing him with some disfavour. I want to be able to count upon your help. I'll help you to hang Alfred with pleasure, she replied gruffly. Hanging's too good for him. Ought to be drawn and quartered, like in good old times. We are at one then, said Poirot, for I too want to hang the criminal. Alfred Inglethorpe? Him or another? No question of another. Poor Emily was never murdered until he came along. I don't say she wasn't surrounded by sharks. She was, but it was only her purse they were after. Her life was safe enough. But along comes Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe, and within two months, hey presto. Believe me, Miss Howard, said Poirot very earnestly. If Mr. Inglethorpe is the man, he shall not escape me. On my honour, I will hang him as high as Haman. That's better said Miss Howard more enthusiastically. But I must ask you to trust me. Now, your help may be very valuable to me. I will tell you why, because in all this house of mourning, yours are the only eyes that have wept. Miss Howard blinked, and a new note crept into the gruffness of her voice. If you mean that I was fond of her, yes, I was. You know, Emily was a selfish old woman in her way. She was very generous, but she always wanted a return. She never let people forget what she had done for them, and that way she missed love. Don't think she ever realised it, though, or felt the lack of it. Hope not, anyway. I was on a different footing. I took my stand from the first. So many pounds a year I'm worth to you. Well and good but not a penny piece besides, not a pair of gloves, nor a theatre ticket. She didn't understand, was very offended sometimes, said I was foolishly proud. It wasn't that, but I couldn't explain. Anyway, I kept my self-respect, and so, out of the whole bunch, I was the only one who could allow myself to be fond of her. I watched over her, I guarded her from the lot of them, and then a glib-tongued scoundrel comes along and poo, all my years of devotion go for nothing. Poirot nodded sympathetically. I understand, mademoiselle. I understand all you feel. It is most natural. You think that we are lukewarm, that we lack fire and energy. But trust me, it is not so. John stuck his head in at this juncture and invited us both to come up to Mrs. Inglethorpe's room as he and Mr. Wells had finished looking through the desk in the boudoir. As we went up the stairs, John looked back to the dining room door and lowered his voice confidentially. Look here, what's going to happen when these two meet? I shook my head helplessly. I've told Mary to keep them apart if she can. Will she be able to do so? The Lord only knows. There's one thing, Inglethorpe himself won't be too keen on meeting her. You've got the keys still, haven't you, Poirot? I asked as we reached the door of the locked room. Taking the keys from Poirot, John unlocked it and we all passed in. The lawyer went straight to the desk and John followed him. My mother kept most of her important papers in this despatch case, I believe, he said. Poirot drew out the small bunch of keys. Permit me, I locked it, out of precaution this morning. But it's not locked now. Impossible. See? And John lifted the lid as he spoke. Mils tonneres, cried Poirot, dumbfounded. And I, who have both the keys in my pocket? He flung himself upon the case. Suddenly, he stiffened. Et voilà une affaire. This lock has been forced. What? Poirot laid down the case again. But who forced it? Why should they? When? But the door was locked? 
These exclamations burst from us disjointedly. Poirot answered them categorically, almost mechanically. Who? That is the question. Why? Ah, if I only knew. When? Since I was here an hour ago. As to the door being locked, it is a very ordinary lock. Probably any other of the door keys in this passage would fit it. We stared at one another blankly. Poirot had walked over to the mantelpiece. He was outwardly calm, but I noticed his hands, which from long force of habit were mechanically straightening the spill vases on the mantelpiece, were shaking violently. See here, it was like this, he said at last. There was something in that case, some piece of evidence, slight in itself perhaps, but still enough of a clue to connect the murderer with the crime. It was vital to him that it should be destroyed before it was discovered, and its significance appreciated. Therefore, he took the risk, the great risk, of coming in here. Finding the case locked, he was obliged to force it, thus betraying his presence. For him to take that risk, it must have been something of great importance. But what was it? Ah! cried Poirot with a gesture of anger. That I do not know. A document of some kind, without doubt. Possibly the scrap of paper Dorcas saw in her hand yesterday afternoon. And I... His anger burst forth freely. Miserable animal that I am, I guessed nothing. I have behaved like an imbecile. I should never have left that case here. I should have carried it away with me. Ah, triple pig. And now it is gone. It is destroyed, but is it destroyed? Is there not yet a chance? We must leave no stone unturned. It he rushed like a madman from the room, and I followed him as soon as I had sufficiently recovered my wits. But by the time I had reached the top of the stairs, he was out of sight. Mary Cavendish was standing where the staircase branched, staring down into the hall in the direction in which he had disappeared. What has happened to your extraordinary little friend, Mr. Hastings? He has just rushed past me like a mad bull. He's rather upset about something, I remarked feebly. I really did not know how much Poirot would wish me to disclose. As I saw a faint smile gather on Mrs. Cavendish's expressive mouth, I endeavoured to try and turn the conversation by saying, They haven't met yet, have they? Who? Mr. Inglethorpe and Miss Howard. She looked at me in rather a disconcerting manner. Do you think it would be such a disaster if they did meet? Well, don't you? I said, rather taken aback. No. She was smiling in her quiet way. I should like to see a good flare-up. It would clear the air. At present, we are all thinking so much and saying so little. John doesn't think so, I remarked. He's anxious to keep them apart. Oh, John! Something in her tone fired me, and I blurted out, Old John's an awfully good sort. She studied me curiously for a minute or two, and then said, to my great surprise, You are loyal to your friend. I like you for that. Aren't you my friend too? I am a very bad friend. Why do you say that? Because it is true. I am charming to my friends one day, and forget all about them the next. I don't know what impelled me, but I was nettled, and I said foolishly, and not in the best of taste. Yet you seem to be invariably charming to Dr. Bowerstein. Instantly, I regretted my words. Her face stiffened. I had the impression of a steel curtain coming down and blotting out the real woman. Without a word, she turned and went swiftly up the stairs, whilst I stood like an idiot, gaping after her. I was recalled to other matters by a frightful row going on below. I could hear Poirot shouting and expounding. I was vexed to think that my diplomacy had been in vain. The little man appeared to be taking the whole house into his confidence, a proceeding of which I, for one, doubted the wisdom. Once again, I could not help regretting that my friend was so prone to lose his head in moments of excitement.
I stepped briskly down the stairs. The sight of me calmed Poirot almost immediately. I drew him aside. My dear fellow, I said, is this wise? Surely you don't want the whole house to know of this occurrence. You are actually playing into the criminal's hands. You think so, Hastings? I'm sure of it. Well, well, my friend, I will be guided by you. Good. Although, unfortunately, it is a little too late now. Sure. He looked so crestfallen and abashed that I felt quite sorry, though I still thought my rebuke a just and wise one. Well, he said at last, let us go, mon ami. You have finished here. For the moment, yes. You will walk back with me to the village? Willingly. He picked up his little suitcase and we went out through the open window in the drawing room. Cynthia Murdoch was just coming in and Poirot stood aside to let her pass. Excuse me, mademoiselle, one minute. Yes? She turned inquiringly. Did you ever make up Mrs. Inglethorpe's medicines? A slight flush rose in her face as she answered rather constrainedly, No. Only her powders? The flush deepened as Cynthia replied, Oh, yes, I did make up some sleeping powders for her once. These? Poirot produced the empty box which had contained powders. She nodded. Can you tell me what they were? Sulfonal? Veronal? No, they were bromide powders. Ah! Thank you, mademoiselle. Good morning. As we walked briskly away from the house, I glanced at him more than once. I had often before noticed that, if anything excited him, his eyes turned green like a cat's. They were shining like emeralds now. My friend, he broke out at last, I have a little idea, a very strange and probably utterly impossible idea. And yet, it fits in. I shrugged my shoulders. I privately thought that Poirot was rather too much given to these fantastic ideas. In this case, surely the truth was only too plain and apparent. So that is the explanation of the blank label on the box, I remarked. Very simple, as you said. I really wonder that I did not think of it myself. Poirot did not appear to be listening to me. They have made one more discovery, La Bar, he observed, jerking his thumb over his shoulder in the direction of Styles. Mr. Wells told me as we were going upstairs. What was it? Locked up in the desk in the boudoir, they found a will of Mrs. Inglethorpe's, dated before her marriage, leaving her fortune to Alfred Inglethorpe. It must have been made just at the time they were engaged. It came quite as a surprise to Wells, and to John Cavendish also. It was written on one of those printed will forms and witnessed by two of the servants, not Dorcas. Did Mr. Inglethorpe know of it? He says not. One might take that with a grain of salt, I remarked sceptically. All these wills are very confusing. Tell me. How did those scribbled words on the envelope help you to discover that a will was made yesterday afternoon? Poirot smiled. Mon ami, have you ever, when writing a letter, been arrested by the fact that you did not know how to spell a certain word? Yes, often. I suppose everyone has. Exactly. And have you not, in such a case, tried the word once or twice on the edge of the blotting paper? or a spare scrap of paper to see if it looked right. Well, that is what Mrs. Inglethorpe did. You will notice that the word possessed is spelt first with one S and subsequently with two correctly. To make sure she had further tried it in a sentence, thus, I am possessed. Now, what did that tell me? It told me that Mrs. Inglethorpe had been writing the word possessed that afternoon, and, having the fragment of paper found in the grate fresh in my mind, the possibility of a will, a document almost certain to contain that word, occurred to me at once.
this possibility was confirmed by a further circumstance. In the general confusion, the boudoir had not been swept that morning, and near the desk were several traces of brown mould and earth. The weather had been perfectly fine for some days, and no ordinary boots would have left such a heavy deposit. I strolled to the window and saw at once that the begonia beds had been newly planted. The mould in the beds was exactly similar to that on the floor of the boudoir, and also I learnt from you that they had been planted yesterday afternoon. I was now sure that one, or possibly both, of the gardeners, for there were two sets of footprints in the bed, had entered the boudoir, for if Mrs Inglethorpe had merely wished to speak to them, she would, in all probability, have stood at the window, and they would not have come into the room at all. I was now quite convinced that she had made a fresh will and had called the two gardeners in to witness her signature. Events proved that I was right in my supposition. That was very ingenious, I could not help admitting. I must confess that the conclusions I drew from those few scribbled words were quite erroneous. He smiled. You gave too much rein to your imagination. Imagination is a good servant and a bad master. The simplest explanation is always the most likely. Another point. How did you know that the key of the dispatch case had been lost? I did not know it. It was a guess that turned out to be correct. You observed that it had a piece of twisted wire through the handle. That suggested to me at once that it had possibly been wrenched off a flimsy key ring. Now, if it had been lost and recovered, Mrs Inglethorpe would at once have replaced it on her bunch. But on her bunch, I found what was obviously the duplicate key, very new and bright, which led me to the hypothesis that somebody else had inserted the original key in the lock of the despatch case. Yes, I said. Alfred Inglethorpe, without doubt. Poirot looked at me curiously. You are very sure of his guilt? Well, naturally. Every fresh circumstance seems to establish it more clearly. On the contrary, said Poirot quietly, there are several points in his favour. Oh, come now. Yes? I see only one, and that? that he was not in the house last night. Bad shot, as you English say. You have chosen the one point that to my mind tells against him. How is that? Because if Mr. Inglethorpe knew that his wife would be poisoned last night, he would certainly have arranged to be away from the house. His excuse was an obviously trumped up one. That leaves us two possibilities. Either he knew what was going to happen, or he had a reason of his own for his absence. And that reason? I asked sceptically. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. How should I know? Discreditable without doubt. This Mr. Inglethorpe, I should say, is somewhat of a scoundrel, but that does not of necessity make him a murderer. I shook my head, unconvinced. We do not agree, eh? said Poirot. Well, let us leave it. Time will show which of us is right. Now let us turn to other aspects of the case. What do you make of the fact that all the doors of the bedroom were bolted on the inside? Well, I considered, one must look at it logically. True. I should put it this way. The doors were bolted. Our own eyes have told us that. Yet the presence of the candle grease on the floor and the destruction of the will prove that during the night someone entered the room. You agree so far? Perfectly. Put with admirable clearness. Proceed. Well, I said, encouraged, as the person who entered did not do so by the window, nor by miraculous means, it follows that the door must have been opened from inside by Mrs. Inglethorpe herself. That strengthens the conviction that the person in question was her husband. She would naturally open the door to her own husband. Poirot shook his head. 
Why should she? She had bolted the door leading into his room. A most unusual proceeding on her part. She had had a most violent quarrel with him that very afternoon. No, he was the last person she would admit. But you agree with me that the door must have been opened by Mrs. Inglethorpe herself. There is another possibility. She may have forgotten to bolt the door into the passage when she went to bed and have got up later, towards morning, and bolted it then. Poirot, is that seriously your opinion? No, I do not say it is so, but it might be. Now, to turn to another feature, what do you make of the scrap of conversation you overheard between Mrs. Cavendish and her mother-in-law? I had forgotten that, I said thoughtfully. That is as enigmatical as ever. It seems incredible that a woman like Mrs. Cavendish, proud and reticent to the last degree, should interfere so violently in what was certainly not her affair. Precisely. It was an astonishing thing for a woman of her breeding to do. It is certainly curious, I agreed. Still, it is unimportant and need not be taken into account. A groan burst from Poirot. What have I always told you? Everything must be taken into account. If the fact will not fit the theory, it... Let the theory go. Well, we shall see, I said, nettled. Yes, we shall see. We had reached Leastway Cottage, and Poirot ushered me upstairs to his own room. He offered me one of the tiny Russian cigarettes he himself occasionally smoked. I was amused to notice that he stowed away the used matches most carefully in a little china pot. My momentary annoyance vanished. Poirot had placed our two chairs in front of the open window, which commanded a view of the village street. The fresh air blew in warm and pleasant. It was going to be a hot day. Suddenly my attention was arrested by a weedy-looking young man rushing down the street at a great pace. It was the expression on his face that was extraordinary, a curious mingling of terror and agitation. Look, Poirot, I said. He leant forward. Tiens, he said. It is Mr. Mace from the chemist's shop. He is coming here. The young man came to a halt before Leastway's cottage and, after hesitating a moment, pounded vigorously at the door. A little minute, cried Poirot from the window. I come. Motioning to me to follow him, he ran swiftly down the stairs and opened the door. Mr. Mace began at once. Oh, Mr. Poirot, I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but I heard that you'd just come back from the hall. Yes, we have. The young man moistened his dry lips. His face was working curiously. It's all over the village about old Mrs. Inglethorpe dying so suddenly. They do say, he lowered his voice cautiously, that it's poison. Poirot's face remained quite impassive. Only the doctors can tell us that, Mr. Mace. Yes, exactly, of course. The young man hesitated, and then his agitation was too much for him. He clutched Poirot by the arm and sank his voice to a whisper. Just tell me this, Mr. Poirot, it isn't, it isn't strychnine, is it? I hardly heard what Poirot replied, something evidently of a non-committal nature. The young man departed, and as he closed the door, Poirot's eyes met mine. Yes, he said, nodding gravely. He will have evidence to give at the inquest. We went slowly upstairs again. I was opening my lips when Poirot stopped me with a gesture of his hand. Not now, not now, mon ami. I have need of reflection. My mind is in some disorder, which is not well. For about ten minutes he sat in dead silence, perfectly still, except for several expressive motions of his eyebrows, and all the time his eyes grew steadily greener. At last he heaved a deep sigh. It is well. The bad moment has passed. Now all is arranged and classified. One must never permit confusion. The case is not clear yet, no, for it is of the most complicated. It puzzles me.
me, Hercule Poirot, there are two facts of significance. And what are they? The first is the state of the weather yesterday. That is very important. But it was a glorious day, I interrupted. Poirot, you're pulling my leg. Not at all. The thermometer registered 80 degrees in the shade. Do not forget that, my friend. It is the key to the whole riddle. And the second point, I asked. The important fact that Monsieur Inglethorpe wears very peculiar clothes, has a black beard, and uses glasses. Poirot, I cannot believe you are serious. I am absolutely serious, my friend. But this is childish. No, it is very momentous. And supposing the coroner's jury returns a verdict of willful murder against Alfred Inglethorpe, what becomes of your theories then? They would not be shaken because twelve stupid men had happened to make a mistake, but that will not occur. For one thing, a country jury is not anxious to take responsibility upon itself, and Mr. Inglethorpe stands practically in the position of local squire. Also, he added placidly, I should not allow it. You would not allow it. No. I looked at the extraordinary little man, divided between annoyance and amusement. He was so tremendously sure of himself, as though he read my thoughts, he nodded gently. Oh yes, mon ami, I would do what I say. He got up and laid his hand on my shoulder. His physiognomy underwent a complete change. Tears came into his eyes. In all this, you see, I think of that poor Mrs. Inglethorpe who is dead. She was not extravagantly loved, no, but she was very good to us Belgians. I owe her a debt. I endeavoured to interrupt, but Poirot swept on. Let me tell you this, Hastings. She would never forgive me if I let Alfred Inglethorpe, her husband, be arrested now when a word from me could save him.